and you still will have all day tomorrow to submit a written comment if you want to. So if, if somebody feels like they don't want to wait around, they could send in a comment tomorrow. Okay? So the first speaker is John Rosano. Yes, no, it hasn't changed. And if you could please come up to the podium and use the microphone. Thank you, sir. My name is John Rosano. I'm the supervisor in the town of Wayweanda. CPV first came to Wayweanda approximately 2008. And since then, the town of Wayweanda has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars conducting thorough comprehensive review of this project and it's lasted over five years. We've hired specialists to review every aspect of the project from air, water, and all the other environmental issues. Seeker has been completed in 2012. CPV has received all necessary approvals from the Town of Wayweander Planning Board, from the Wayweander Zoning Board, and from the Town Board. And considering the millions of dollars that they've invested in this project, we have no reason to doubt that their business entity has been formed properly. Additionally, CPV has also received municipal consent in October 2013 from the city of Middletown for locating necessary pipes. Just standing where the gentleman advised me to. about if I just hold on to it? Go back to where you were. Um, there's no reason for you to look at people when you're talking. You just listen. Okay. As I said, additionally, CPV has received municipal consent in October of 2013 from the City of Middletown for locating necessary pipes on the city property. Therefore, they have received all additional, all municipal approvals from Middletown. I feel that this is a vital project for our area, and I hope this project is approved and granted the Certificate of Public Necessity and Convenience. Thank you. All right, off the record for a second. Um, you folks with the young children, can you move them over there somewhere so you're not near the entrance in case there's an emergency? And we're going to need to leave a pathway through here. So some of you are either going to have to back. Some of the local union guys give up the seats for the mom and children. That would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're back on the record. Uh, the next speaker will be David Cole. Good evening. My name is David Cole. I'm a councilman, town of Wayweanda, and I again concur with Supervisor Rosano's remarks. Therefore, I'll keep my remarks even shorter and to the point. Uh, this certificate of necessity and compliance with convenient to public service, as John had mentioned, is, was granted with the FEIS uh, with the planning board on February 8, 2012, as stated, and the finding statement that was adopted on May 23, 2012, as you have here in your literature. I just would like to uh, mention that Governor Cuomo's intent as stated is to uh, decommission Indian Point by 2015. That uh, produces four times the amount of energy that the amount that CPV is going to be uh, producing. Therefore, this is a necessary project. And last but not least, uh, the tax relief and economic benefit to be derived by this project and jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is the County Executive, Stephen Newhouse. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Steve Newhouse. I'm the Orange County Executive. Uh, New York State is a home rule state. Uh, the supervisor just uh, spoke before me and said that all the local uh, author authorizations and approvals are in place. So I see no reason in why this should be stopped at this point. It went through the process, the legal process in New York, and I think this project needs to move forward and get the approval. Thank you. The next speaker is Gerald Cook. And after that will be Jill Lindner. Hi, my name is Jerry Cook. I'm a Sierra Club member. And I'm opposed to this project, but I got solutions to make things better. Uh, basically, in my written statement, I'm complaining about the amount of CO2 we have in the United States, the 14-year drought out west, the loss of farm life, uh, livelihood, the flooding in the Midwest, again, loss of property, life, uh, everything's changed, all because of contamination of our fossil burning. So, but there are solutions. I got two of them. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. But one of them, there's a company called uh, Courage-Us. And what they're doing is underneath the power lines, they're coming up with a way to have renewable energy. They can take, because the power lines lose energy, they're able to minimize that and be able to put energy back into the system. Now my idea is we got thousands of miles of power lines in New York State why can't we put solar panels all over the state? Did every union guy here work? Got cement guys, steel guys, electric workers, suppliers. Why am I? Why are nuts? <laughs> you have the whole nine yards. The other solution is in Europe and even in New York City. There's a thing called underwater turbines. Okay, has the water? Put, it's like a propeller. The water comes moves the propeller, things spin, they make electricity, okay? Quebec is using them. They're expecting from the St. Lawrence River to produce enough electricity through the kinetic energy of the river that's going to equal 15 uh, coal-burning mega power plants. So we don't need all this gas going back up that's going to hurt my grandchildren and their grandchildren. <laughs> all right. There are alternatives. There is work. And there is a better way. Okay, the next next speaker is Jill Lindner, and she'll be followed by Jacob. Um, I'm not sure I can read this. Tall. Does that sound familiar to someone? Okay, go ahead, Jill. <coughs> First, I have a question. How many people are from Orange County? All oh, right, okay. Many of the people here tonight have come because they were told to come by union leaders whose CPV has influenced through the promise of construction jobs. A few local politicians, business, community health care, and Orange County Industrial Development Agency executives who have, persuaded, who have been persuaded by CPV representatives that is their, in their interest, that there is a need for this project, that there, it will produce clean energy, benefit the local economy and their, and their community, and, the, and are here also. These people have, have been given speaking points passed on by CPV hires, and they will echo the CPV marketing talk. I come here as a concerned resident of Orange County, a mother, a grandmother, a person deeply disappointed and outraged, given all we know, experience and need and see in the media about global warming, climate change, extreme weather disasters, that we must discuss the prospect of another fossil fuel pollution laden project 
in our community, the CPV Valley Energy Center. I am not able to speak to all the considerations before the Public Service Commission as regards to the various laws, regulations, and issues that bear upon their decision regarding competitive power ventures petition. I speak from my heart and common sense. What I, have to, what I want to say to the Commission is that, based on my knowledge, what I read and hear, there is no actual need for CPV's project. Whereas there is a need that is, uh, that is currently unmet. Not in our area, not even in New York City, so where? Sure, our power goes down during extreme weather. We have seen this winter and during major storms like Sandy, Irene, Isaac, and the rest. But that is to be expected, and CPV will not resolve that problem. And we do pay excessively high prices for our electricity compared to other parts of the state and the country. But will the PSC or CPV assure us that our electric bills will go down if their power plant is built? I don't think so. On the contrary, I recently read articles in the Times Herald Record by Jessica D. Napoli that the Federal Ed Energy Regulate Regulatory Commission created a new capacity zone to fund power generation projects among which I assume CPV is likely to one. The journalist reported that this new zone would raise utility rates for Hudson Valley ratepayers and that the PSC along with the local supplier and the New York Power Authority were fighting in court because it unfairly places the cost of building and re or renovating power plants on the people rather than the investors. I also understand that Orange County Industrial Development Agency and the town of Wayweanda have committed to a property tax abatement, sales tax exemption, and other incentives to underwrite this project. If CPV's power plant would, would be beneficial and the company assured of its profitability, why do, they have to, why do they have to have government and taxpayer and ratepayer subsidies to build it? Why can't their investors risk their own money? Why put the burden of finan financing a project for an out-of-state corporation and the risk of its default on the little people, like my neighbors and me? Why are the neighbors and I being made to pay for, pay, pay to put our families at risk so CPV can make a profit? The members of the Public Service Commission know better than, than many of us here, and there are many less costly and more environmentally friendly energy alternatives than CPV's project. We read and see news reports about inexpensive hydropower and wind generations, upstate solar, both commercial and local net metering, and, gr and grid moder modernization, transmission and technology upgrades, of all, all of which offer cleaner renewable energy, job creating, and economically benefit, beneficial opportunities, while sl slowing or reversing global warming and our dependence on fossil fuel. How is the project like this that will dump over two million tons of greenhouse gases, carcinogens, and toxic chemicals annually into the air we breathe and jeopardize our health and welfare? Our environment and our econ economy has been allowed to get this far. I care about my family, my neighbors, and my community. I believe in our country, and I believe it's time to, for us to trans transition to renewable energy, and is, is now and, I'm sorry, to renewable, renewable energy is now, and CPV's project is, is not a part of the re renewable energy portfolio. We all know that CPV's representatives, consultants, and lawyers have maneuvered their project through the system. They have persuaded many people to endorse it, and some are here tonight. I believe CPV has misled these people, politicians, and the business <coughs> community. I am here because I stand with the people who want to save our community, our country, and our planet. 
I believe in and hope for a renewable energy future in which all of us stand together in the struggle to save our country and our world. I see regarding rewarding high-paying long-term green job opportunities as we transition to renewable energy. I envision a future with strong economy built on hope, on health, and preservation of the environment that sustains us all. I stand with those who ask th that the PSC deny CPV, their petition for a certificate of convenience and necessity, approval to finance the construction of their power plant, and approval of a lightened regulatory regime, which although I am unclear as to what is meant by that, I feel certain it is not in the public interest. Thank you. Okay, Jacob Tall, and I'm sorry if I'm trashing your last. To wheel, okay. And then the next speaker will be Deborah Slattery. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I'm here to, my name is Jacob Tawil, Commissioner of Public Works, City of Middletown. I'm here to represent Mayor uh, De Stefano, City of Middletown Mayor. Uh, he, he apologizes he could not be here tonight. We're going to be submitting his comments in support of CPV for your consideration. Yeah, that, that was an excellent way to do your comments, wasn't it? Deborah Slattery, uh, followed by Tula T S A L I S. Salas? Okay. So Deborah Slattery is next. Okay. This is going to be very brief. Um, CPV, can you hear me? Okay. CPV has created a false need and necessity for this power plant, as the need clearly does not exist. As you are aware, New York State consumes less overall energy than any other state save for Rhode Island. There is absolutely no need for this type of power plant, be it 630 megawatts at its beginning or now at 820 megawatts. What is needed is economical and environmentally friendly alternatives such as wind, solar, and other renewable energy sources, which is indeed an urgent need and necessity. The advantages of renewables over frack gas are far less costly to the environment, our lives, and that of our children. Renewables are more financially sound and would create far more jobs than dirty fossil fuels. CPV is dependent on taxpayer and ratepayer subsidies. As you are aware, due to the new capacity zone implemented by FERC and New York ISO, ratepayers will be seeing a 6 to 15% increase in the utility bill. Why should we have to foot the bill for yet another free-loading, tax-dodging corporation which offers nothing in return? Or at least nothing for the majority of the people who have to live in the community that they seek to destroy. And this is the part that gets me the most because out of everybody here, uh, I I'm an adversely impacted resident. This is right next to my home. Also, what I think is insane to me is no one, no one has mentioned that this is less than five miles away from our schools that have approximately 4,400 students and my child included. That's insane to me. This is absolutely unacceptable and irresponsible that such a dreadful pro proposal be allowed this close to children, let alone that it has gotten as far as this hearing tonight. I ask that this commission deny CPV their permits of convenience and necessity, approval of financing, and approval of a lightened regulatory regime, and I do know what that means. And if this does go through, don't lighten that regime. Two cents. Okay, uh, Tula and um, William Mako. 
Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Tula Salas, and um, I'm here to say first that I am in complete support of renewable energy. I'm also in support of unions, and I'm also in support of jobs. I thought when I first uh, when I first arrived that I was going to talk about the health issues that are involved. And by the way, um, I, I come from Warwick. Um, many of my friends and neighbors come from towns all around. And those towns, not just way, way yonder, those towns are going to be affected as well. And I am very surprised that uh, people in, in the towns within the, the entire region of Orange County and also parts of Sullivan and other, other counties who will also be affected, I am very surprised that it wasn't discussed earlier. So I'm not, go the health effects are serious. They involve everything from nausea and headaches and, and fainting and to, to serious uh, effects regarding development and uh, for children and fetuses and also cancer and, and those kinds of diseases down the road. So this is not a small thing, it's serious and it, sh it should be taken and thought about very carefully before this company is allowed to build a plant in Orange County. They're also building a plant in Northern California and some other places, they're, they're big. But what I do want to talk about is the question of jobs, the question of children, and uh, c generations that are coming. I have, I have nine grandchildren, and I worry about them. I worry about them a great deal. I ask myself, what kind of a world will they, will my grandchildren find when they are 20 and 21 and looking for jobs like you guys? Those of you who are struggling to, to work, those of you who are struggling to, to figure out what, where you're going to get the money to raise your own children, I, 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 this is hard and I know it. But this isn't the answer. Solar energy, wind power, water power has been around for 30 plus years. It is real. If you don't believe that, you, all you have to do is do a little bit of research and you'll find out for yourselves. It's real, it's, it exists, it's good, it's healthy, it's, it's real en energy that will not contaminate our water and our air and our forests and our children. And I really very strongly would like you to think about it. I'm talking to all the young people in this room who are part of this union. I really know how you feel. But don't go for the easy one here. Go a little, go a little deeper. Um, if a company comes along, or if the administration in Weyweyanda and Orange County put their heads together, they can come up with a much better plan, and they can build it in the same time. So please, consider this. Thank you. Uh, William Makovsky, yes, to be followed by Mary Makovsky. Okay, my name is uh, William Makovsky. I live in Warwick, uh, New York, and I'm speaking in to deny the certificate. Uh, I'm not going to re-mention things that have been mentioned already, but I would point out that the ozone pollution in the area will be increased because of the NOx the nitrogen oxides that are going to be emitted by the plant, combining with the hydrocarbons, uh, not only being produced now, but being produced by methane leakage, which is also uh, going to occur as part of this, as pipelines and compressor stations also uh, release uh, a certain amount of methane. Uh, the health effects on people are substantial. Uh, respiratory illness kills millions of people a year and uh, cost billions of dollars. <clears throat> uh, when we look at methane, we think, oh, this is so clean compared to coal. Well, there is less carbon dioxide emissions compared to coal, but <clears throat> there's also a lot of methane emissions. 
part of that comes from leakage, but part of that comes from the fracking plants and the, the source of the fuel uh, where fracking wells will leak. Uh, the industry says that five to seven percent of new fracking wells leak immediately and uh, within 20 to 30 years, about 50 percent will be leaking. This methane is, uh, is a very strong greenhouse gas. Uh, do we need this plant at this time? Uh, I would argue no. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at household electricity consumption, we find that it's decreasing. It's been decreasing for the past number of years, and that it's expected to decline in an accelerating fashion. Uh, there are NYSERDA efficiency programs. Uh, there are programs in New York City replacing lighting with LED lighting. Uh, can save hundreds of megawatts of power. Uh, it's often thought that this plant is really efficient, but in Europe, when they <clears throat> build a plant like this, they also plan to use the additional waste heat that's generated and provide industries locally so that the waste heat can be used by those industries and give them an advantage uh, and also give long-term employment at those locations. This is not the case with this plant. Uh, other speakers have mentioned uh, water, wind, solar, and I would just like to mention that we have a lot of offshore wind in New York State, and that can provide an awful lot of the power uh, that uh, <clears throat> we, we might need because uh, Indian Point might close. Um, this plant will lock us into a polluting, uh, climate-changing system for the next 30 to 50 years. Think about that. And that's a really bad thing to do. Uh, photovoltaics have great peak demand advantages. Uh, for example, uh, when we need the most electricity is when the photovoltaic systems are producing the, much, the, the most in summertime, for example. And that reduces the need for other uh, small uh, polluting power plants that are put online to meet those peak loads. Uh, overall, I think if we look at the number of construction jobs that would be created by solar, wind, hydro, more grid construction and efficiency programs, we would find there'd be no comparison between the number of long-term jobs created by those alternatives compared to this one plant. Think about that. Okay, the next speaker is Mary Makovsky, followed by Jenna Elston. I object to this plant for several reasons. The energy it would provide is not necessary. If conservation, efficiency, and renewable energy expansion are fully implemented, New York State has committed to reducing energy use and reducing greenhouse emissions. They are not going to get there unless they do something about it. It's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to do it. Um, also, the location in a densely populated area near homes, businesses, a community college, the county seat, other schools, is not appropriate for a plant that's going to produce substantial air pollution. It does burn cleaner than coal or oil, but natural gas is not a clean fuel. Don't believe the ads. It still produces substantial CO2, which contributes to climate change, particulate matter, which is a serious danger to human health, and nitrogen oxides, a main ingredient of smog. Combined with the existing hydrocarbon pollution, the nitrogen oxides will increase ground level ozone pollution. The, this area is in a basin, which will collect and concentrate air pollution particularly during stagnant air periods or those wonderful hot summers we are inclined to get now. This plant is possible only because it will use gas obtained by high volume hydraulic fracturing or fracking. This is a relatively new technology, not an old technology as you have been told, that is being used before its full impacts have been fully assessed. However, evidence is accumulating that it has already caused damage to the environment and to human health. The methane released in the extraction and transmission is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. 
it would be foolish to lock us into fracked gas for the long term, when build it, which building this plant would do. Using fracked gas will also increase pressure to allow this technology in New York State. There is too much risk to our water and our health. Fracked gas also requires a network of pipelines and compressor stations. Leaking pipelines, explosions, air pollution endanger our citizens. Already a compressor station is operating in Minisink very close to homes. Orange County is much too densely populated and too dependent on small farms to have such industrial activity in our midst. Investing more money and energy in fossil fuel infrastructure is counterproductive uh, because there has been reduced use of electricity in, um, in recent years. This trend needs to be and can be enhanced. We need to be transitioning as quickly as possible to renewable energy and efficiency. This plant takes us in the wrong direction. Due to the large volume of natural gas used by this plant, its operation will compete with available natural gas supply. It will increase prices for residential and small business consumers. If natural gas is exported as is expected, the price will also jump substantially. Both local competition and exporting gas will have a negative impact on economic growth in this region. Is this taken into account in these projections? Have people looked at other at alternatives to building this plant, such as more upstate and offshore wind power, additional small-scale hydro, pumped hydro storage facilities, and strategically placed PV production? We need to look to the future for our energy sources. In addition, I just wanted to add, there are many union members here um, who need good jobs. We need jobs that will support livelihoods. We also need jobs that will support lives. The 600 jobs that are expected here for construction only, temporary jobs, will not necessarily be local jobs. I can see some signs here. These will not necessarily be local jobs. It would be nice, and you might have even been promised this, by the way, as other people have been promised this, to find it was not so. So for all these reasons, I ask that the Commission deny this request for the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity, since this plant is neither convenient nor necessary for Orange County. Okay, the next speaker is Jenna Elston, followed by Randolph Hurst. My name is uh, Gina Elston. I am a resident of the town of Wavianda. I have voted for most of the officials that are standing in this room that I am embarrassed to say that I have voted for. It's quite seriously. <laughs> Probably. It should have been. I'm going to say for all the decision makers that if they want to pass this, you could put your life where your mouth is. You can come and live in my home that is right across the street from this uh, plant. Actually, I'm on the ridge uh, higher. 300 foot tall uh, stacks might not even be able to be clear of my property where I enjoy laying, you know, sitting in my backyard and opening my windows. Right now, every time the fire alarm's going to go off and the wind blows, I'll be worrying <coughs> whether it's blowing into my property where my children live and where there's hundreds of children that live on two roads just across the street. This does not include the city of Middletown. This company does not meet the new criteria by the governor. It is using two fossil fuels, oil and natural gas, which are on the new energy superhighway that he wants to get away from those. He wants to use solar and wind turbines. I can't even imagine how this is even on the books to be operating. Uh, Everybody's talked about concern about the power plants and changing climate and weather conditions. These properties are being, this property that is owned is wetlands. I have the tax records. I've been arguing with somebody in the audience here about the zoning. The zoning is not clear in the town of Wayanda, and one of the bigger properties is agricultural. 
I can't even see how this property is even being allowed in that area. Uh, the EPRCA, the Community Right to Know action, sections 3011 and 312 have to do with letting the community know when there's going to be toxic chemicals kept or emitted. I live right around the corner from the town of Wavianda. I get flyers in the mail about recreational things at Shannon Park. None of us have gotten flyers about this power plant that seems to be such a great idea for the community of Wavianda, town of Minisink, city of Middletown. Right here, we are only a mile and a half from where this plant will reside. There are two elementary schools, about five churches, two condominiums, three townhomes, and numerous, numerous residential properties. I am also familiar with physical geography. I don't care where the plant is. It is going to bury these toxic chemicals into the ground. If we have a natural disaster, if we have flooding, which that area does flood on a regular basis, it's right off of 84, every area, lower lying area along 84, turns into a damn pond every time we have flooding. So is this plant able to handle that? Is it able to handle 100 degree weather and humid in the summer, change to rainy springs where we flood? We have um, Orange Regional Medical Center five minutes down the road at exit three. We're at exit three, they're at exit four. So depending on which way the wind blows, you're blowing it right towards that too. This happens to be an evacuation area for Indian Point. So we're going to evacuate people in that kind of condition into an area with another power plant. Makes no sense to me. We are now putting Orange County between two controversial power plants. It is ma basically making us a toxic wasteland. The only pro I can find it, and then <coughs> is that for the construction workers. My husband has been a union member twice, has lost his job twice with both those unions, and is now working a non-union job. You don't have to tell me about hardships of losing jobs. He has been without a job six months at a time, hard to pay the bills, know all about it. I feel bad for everybody in this room, but you're being taken advantage of about the hardships that we were following, you know, facing and a deficit of jobs. I feel bad for you and I understand. But in two years, this plant is only offering 25 jobs, five which will probably go out of state to whoever's going to run the plant, 20 jobs. I could put a fast food restaurant there and offer 25 jobs to everybody in the community. Denton Hill is right across 84. We have two speedies that are already <coughs> too close to our municipal well. This is a municipal well. This is going to also have a speedies um, report. And what is that going to do for our water community? It's probably just going to raise our water prices, which are extra, you know, extraordinary right now. Will our electric bills be cut? Probably not. Is a community which the power plant resides receiving energy? If so, would it be a lower cost to us? Probably not. Emergency response plan. This plant has to have an emergency response plan. What is it? What is the radius of the affected? Does it include evacuation? Our um, emergency responders are awesome, but they're volunteer. We do not have full-time responders. I do not know how we're going to be able to handle a, an explosion or some other type of problem at this plant. Everybody's already talked about the emissions. I'm not going to talk about that. Explosion, I will talk about. We only have volunteer forces. I don't know how they're going to get in there. If it's during the winter, 84 has been closed by the governor twice this past year. How do we expect um, other responders to get to the property? Um, I really have little faith in the DEC. They obviously let the Orange Regional Medical Center go in. Every time the Walk Hill floods, three access roads to that hospital are closed. So can we rely on them that they have done the correct reports for this property. I'm just trying to go through this really quickly. We have extreme weather fluctuation from season to season. Unfortunately, I have a lot of uh, experience with chemical plants, power plants, and I used to work for Siemens that is providing the two, three gas turbines for this property. It's only supposed to work for 30 days on oil a year. I can tell you right now if something goes wrong with the gas turbines, minimum it is 30 days for a turbine to be fixed. Unless they are coming in with their own parts, for, and most people don't do the parts because they're very expensive, they have to be fixed. Minimum time is 30 days if the company wants to pay a premium. 
If not, it's it is 60 to 90 days. 720 hours is 30 days. So I'm guessing that it's going to be running on oil a little bit more than 30 days a year. It's close to the Pine Hill Cemetery. We have a code chapter 66 in the town of Wayweanda that nothing is supposed to be built 100 feet from that. One of the building lots that this is owned by, that CPV owns, which is where I think the plant is going, shares a property line with a residence with that cemetery and with a brand new rental community called Horizons at Wayweanda. So not only are we in the wetland conference, and it's not industrial. This is not an industrial area. This is a residential area. I have the tax maps. I have the tax on the properties, the tax reports on the properties. If you want me to explain to you, it's saying it's running on 21 acres out of the, whatever, 122 acres. If you want me to go through it, only 12 acres are actually able to be built on. So I don't see how we're using 21 acres for a power plant. It's ridiculous where it is. As I've said, it's in a residential area. It also lies between the city of Middletown and the town of Wayweanda. Anybody who's from this area knows on Scotchtown Road, there is a bridge there that lies between two municipalities by the Army Corps of Engineers. It was deemed unsafe. It has been one lane for five years because those two municipalities cannot agree on who is supposed to take care of that road. The same thing can happen with this power plant. Being between two municipalities is a very, very bad idea <laughs> in the least. Um, I pretty much have talked about most of all I wanted to talk about. I will hand in all the information I have. At this point, I think it's embarrassment that the town of Wayweanda and Orange County are going to allow such a controversial power plant into this area. Next speaker is Randolph Hurst, followed by Adriana, and her last name begins with a G. Then the, the next speaker will be Joan Sichterman, uh, and I'm sorry I'm not pronouncing that right. Thank you, Mr. Agresta. My name is Randolph Hurst. I'm a, I'm a resident of Slate Hill. I'm with Sierra Club, uh, protectorangecounty.org, and a variety of other environmental organizations. Sierra Club and, and these other groups are local citizens groups that have come together to advocate against uh, the costly and unnecessary 820 megawatt CPV power plant and against the un unnecessary pollution and net increase in greenhouse gas emissions that will result from the methane that CPV will burn. Public health, air quality, cost of living, and property values are all placed at risk by the operation of this power plant and by the companion gas pipeline infrastructure that will deliver radioactive radon-rich frac shale gas to fuel CPV. I don't have much time, so I'm going to just try to highlight some of the points. I will be presenting uh, a lengthy, detailed testimony as well, along with my colleague, Jurgen Weckley of the Sierra Club Atlantic Chapter. As identified in the New York State ISO Power Trend 2013 report, and supported by the New York State Energy Plan, there is, and as other fo folks have noted tonight, there is no current or anticipated shortage of electrical power supply here in New York. And we also know that there is no anticipated energy shortage through to the year 2020 and beyond. The immediate energy problem in New York State is the critical imbalance of power supply and demand between regions within the state that deprives customers within our region of lower priced electricity. The surplus low cost electri upstate electricity cannot be delivered for sale to the high cost market south of Orange County due to constraints in the aging transmission system. Construction of CPV will only increase electricity costs for all ratepayers and exacerbate the existing regional imbalance. 
To attract and create jobs in Orange County, we must lower energy costs, not raise them. The Plan New York, <coughs> the pl Plan New York State Energy Highway Blueprint Initiative is implementing transmission upgrades as we speak that will remedy the, pre the present delivery congestion, create utility scale efficiencies, and facilitate the needed transfer of low cost upstate electricity into our region. Since the demand for electricity for power plants has declined, CPV will only succeed at the expense of existing power plants such as the Athens Generating Plant and compete with proposed production from other proposed proposals such as the repurposing of Roston and Bowline and the new construction of the Cricket Valley Energy Center in Dutchess County, whose fiscal viability will be negatively impacted by CPV. New transmission demands are being placed on the Marcy South power line by upstate suppliers, which CPV plans to use to carry its electricity to market. CPV may create congestion that does not now exist. It may therefore be required to construct its own power line at its own expense, as is the case with Cricket Valley in Dutchess County, which, and this has not been previously considered. The Commission currently considers many approaches to address the electrical energy needs of New York State. Upgrades to the electric... Excuse me. <clears throat> upgrades to the electric grid, including transmission and sustain and substation technology efficiencies. New transmission capacity to access available supply, including hydro, wind, and solar, in addition to conservation and demand-side management strategies. In this study entitled Examining the Feasibility of Converting New York State's All-Purpose Energy Infrastructure to One Using Wind, Water, and Solar, unquote, by Dr. Mark Jacobson et al., they, they report that the transition to renewable energy will prevent an estimated 4,000 annual pollution-related deaths, a savings of $33 billion or dollars, or 3% of the state's gross domestic product in related costs every year a savings that alone would pay for the power infrastructure needed in short order, and decreased pollution would reduce climate change costs such as coastal erosion and extreme weather damage uh, by an estimated $3.2 billion annually. Right. This alternative was omitted from the CPV EIS in Weyanda, <clears throat> but is central to the PSC issuance of the Certificate of Necessity. Would it be in the public interest to allow the production of electricity, which is not needed, that will also raise pollution emissions above current levels to the detriment of all Orange County residents? I ask you. The next question the PSC must address is whether to approve CP CPV's petition regarding financing uh, for this proposed plant. We see no evidence. We see only evidence that supports a negative determination. CPV cannot proceed with their proposal, po proposed power plant without government subsidies, tax waivers from all parties, and ratepayer surcharges as exemplified by the proposed FERC capacity zone that artificially raises electricity prices for all consumer customers. CPV requires a property tax exemption or payment in lieu of taxes agreement from the Orange County <coughs> Industrial Development uh, Agency and the town of Wayweanda to avoid county and local tax obligations to the detriment of local taxpayers. The OCIDA is also commit committed to a property purchase lease buyback deal which accommodates reduced below market rate interest, sales tax exemption and other inducements which are necessary to bring this prop project to fruition. The point is that CPV cannot provide a realistic market-based business plan that demonstrates the demand for the power its new plant will produce. It has presented no evidence of the existing need, only a speculative claim of future need dependent upon government, taxpayer, and ratepayer subsidies, which undermines its fiscal credibility. There is no evidence that any earnings would be sufficient to repay bondholders or public agencies. The recent default and bankruptcy of Dinergy's Dan Scammer and Roasten power plants are instructive about the zero-sum competition between power plants in a, market declining de in a market of declining demand. In short, CPV will not serve a public need, has no market, has no purchase contracts, no business plan other than to obtain construction permits and to harvest public subsidies. This does not commend them <coughs> 
for PSC financing approval. The next question PSC must decide is, can CPV render safe, adequate, and reliable service and provide just and reasonable rates? We believe that it cannot and will not. The environmental impact statement documents that the proposed power plant will emit approximately 2.2 million tons of greenhouse gases, as other folks have noted. That also includes neurotoxins, hormone disruptors, uh, nitrous oxide, sulfuric acid mist, volatile organic compounds and particulate matter and more into the Orange County atmosphere annually. That pollution has been justified by the purchase of questionable carbon offsets from the state of Pennsylvania. Moreover, the proposed infrastructure, could, including diesel and ammonia storage tanks, will create unnecessary hazards and threaten the safety, health, and welfare of the people who live nearby. They fear, these people fear, pipeline and power plant explosion, contamination of the air, water, land, and food their families consume, consume and much more. A lawsuit has been filed against the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for issuing an air quality permit based on a purchase of questionable pollution, these questionable pollution credits from Pennsylvania. These credits, however, do not reduce the air pollution caused by CPV, but rather give CPV license to pollute further. Who would believe that the emissions from CPV will not jeopardize the air quality of Weiwianda and all municipalities exposed to the prevailing winds that carry such to toxic discharges? Who would choose to maintain residents or knowingly purchase a home nearby CPV's power plant or establish a business? Who would expose their family, their children to such toxic emissions and dangers? And in view of the cost and controversy surrounding shale gas production, who can guarantee its availability and cost competitiveness with other generating technology? Given this, how can CPV defend the assertion that the proposed plant will render safe, adequate, or reliable service? In view of the foregoing, there can be no justification to afford CPV LLC a lightened regulatory regime. The fact is that this corporation does not offer zero emissions, non-polluting technology. Rather, CPV promises a dependency upon high-risk radioactive Marcellus shale gas and high-volume hydraulic fracturing extraction, transmission, and use. This will jeopardize the air New York residents breathe, our water resources, as well as our agricultural lands of significance, and our food supply, which hold the promise of the Mid-Hudson region's economic prosperity and our hope for the future. Further, a discrepancy has emerged regarding the, pr the production capacity of this plant. The application identified a capacity of 630 megawatts, whereas a letter dated November 18, 2013, from the applicant's, at uh, applicant's attorney, N Nixon Peabody, to the PSC indicated a capacity of 820 megawatts. The reason for this change and the relative impact that the increased capacity will consequently have, especially as it relates to increased greenhouse gas emissions and toxic air pollution need to be evaluated and should also be included in a supplemental environmental impact statement. We therefore ask this, the PSC to deny CPV the required certificate of convenience and necessity, deny the approval and financing and deny approval of light and regulatory regime at this time. We also ask that the PSC direct CPV to commence a supplemental environmental impact statement proceeding, <coughs> excuse me, environmental impact statement proceeding to evaluate the circumstances that have occurred during the EIS process that have since been concluded, especially the impacts of lower prices and increased power supply to be derived from the PSC initiated, quote, AC transmission upgrade process, unquote, case 13D0488 that is currently underway. Additionally, the legal notice for this February 25th, I'm almost done, hearing states that the comments must be received by the PSC secretary by February 26th, a window of less than 24 hours, which is unreasonable as, is, as it is uncommon for hearings such as these. It is therefore requested that the deadline for comments be extended for at least 30 days after the conclusion of this public hearing. Finally, we request that PSC suspend th these certificate deliberations until all the pending air quality permit litigation has been concluded. And I thank you very much.
Okay, there's still a lot of people who want to speak, so let's let's try not to repeat anything, okay? And, and be mindful that um, everybody needs to get a turn. Um, Joan Sichterman is next, and she'll be followed by Frank Sylvester. My home is in the town of Weiwayanda, where I have been tending organic gardens since 1991. Until this past December, when I was invited to attend a meeting about the health impacts of living near gas <laughs> infrastructure, I had no idea that the town had approved an application for CPV to build a 630 megawatt gas-fired power plant. Three miles from my home, I was devastated. Should I touch it? Should I stand farther back from it? Can you hear me? If you touch it, it seems to not make a noise. Speak up, please. After 9-11, I remember looking out of my window at home and asking myself, what is the worst thing that terrorists could do now? The answer that came to me was this. They could fly overhead and poison the air you breathe and the water you drink. They could contaminate your soil. That would pretty much do it. Your home could no longer shelter you. Gardening, let alone organic gardening, would be out of the question. There would be no place to run or to hide. Your life, essentially, would be over. I never imagined that my own country my own state, my own county, my own town would align their interests in ways that could produce the same end result. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not versed in the legal definitions of necessity and convenience as they are used in a proceeding such as this. But I do know that if approval was granted for CPV to operate this power plant, it would be an injustice to the people who live in this area and beyond. It would be one more link in a chain of legal maneuvering that is destroying the natural environment that supports us all. CPV's plant would be powered by dirty fracked gas, transported via the pipelines that are snaking across our landscape from areas already devastated by this extremely polluting technology. How can fracking, so overwhelmingly harmful to human health, be supported by New York State? For though the extraction process itself is still not permitted here, permitting a power plant to operate using this gas condones the practice. And although the town's permission for CPV to site the plant has already been given, I must ask, how can a planning board in a town of 7,000 inhabitants assume lead agency status for a project of the magnitude of the CPV Valley Power Plant, which will impact an entire region? How can this power plant operate in the middle of an area which supports local orchards, dairy and horse farms, and organic farms and gardens? For whom is this necessary or convenient? I understand that the people who live here won't even be using the electricity that CPV proposes to generate. Please don't permit CPV to destroy our area to achieve their corporate goals. I know that there are laws and procedures which are followed and perhaps all of the I's have been dotted and the T's crossed. Perhaps the letter of the law has been followed, but certainly not the spirit of the law. Is it either necessary or convenient for anyone living in this area to suffer negative health impacts, to suffer the loss of the value of their homes, to suffer the loss of a beautiful, life-sustaining environment 
which can never be replaced. On the Commission's website, I read that part of, quote, the primary mission of the New York State Department of Public Service is to ensure safe access to electric services for consumers and to stimulate the use of resources in an environmentally sound manner. It is not safe to live near gas infrastructure. Polluting the air is not environmentally sound. There are alternatives for New York which could be considered. I urge the PSC to deny CP Valley LLC the requested certificate of convenience and necessity pursuant to section 68, the approval of financing pursuant to section 69, and approval of a lightened regulatory regime. Thank you. The next speaker is Frank Sylvester, followed by Dennis Sullivan. Uh, my name is Frank Sylvester, and I represent Local 363 Electricians. And one thing I'd like to get straight is that the 650 jobs will be local, because CPV is a good friend of labor. They signed into a project labor agreement, so all the local trades will be used. And I'm going to make it short. The bottom line is that CPV has passed all the environmental requirements set by the DEP and DEC, so there is no reason for this project not to proceed forward. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Dennis Sullivan, followed by Asha Canalos. Good evening, brothers and sisters, and everybody that came out to review this project. I'm a member of Carpenters Local 279 of Fishkill, New York, third generation carpenter. And I possess something that some of the guys in this room and the ladies in this room have, but most of you don't. I've worked on turbines a good part of my career. Pratt & Whitney turbines, Siemens turbines, Rolls-Royce turbines, you name it. Alice Chalmers going back to coal plants and the natural gas plant that this one is. This is the latest technology out there. It's the cleanest technology out there, and it's a cogeneration plant. It takes the gas and the heat from the one turbine and uses it to power a bigger steam turbine, which operates completely pollution-free. Natural gas, we all use it. Look, I showed respect to everybody out there while you guys were talking. I'd expect to see it. I have natural gas in my home. I turn on my stove. My wife makes a meal. We're cooking. You got your water heater in the house. You got your clothes dryer in the house. It all runs off of natural gas. I'm not aware of anybody dying from somebody roasting a chicken in their house. All right? Not yet. You ain't looking at one that's going to eat it. All right, so I'm in. Everybody, please. No one talks except the speaker, okay? Let's all show some respect. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. We've all heard a litany of pseudo-experts up here talking against this. I'm here to talk in favor of it. All you guys out there, you need work. Some of the best years I ever had and some of the most money I ever earned was working as a millwright in these plants. They're clean. They're spotless. I've been proud to work in them. You go all the way back to Con Edison, to the turn of the century, to Tennessee Valley Authority, construction of the Hoover Dam. This country doesn't go anywhere without electricity. Everybody relies on it here. Solar's great, we're in favor of that. Hydro's great, we're in favor of that. But the project we're talking about tonight is a gas plant here in our hometown. I'm a native New Yorker, 30 years live here in Middletown. I welcome this plant. I'm gonna, and when it's all built and it's going to get built, you guys are going to drive by it every day. It's clean, it's quiet, it's a good neighbor. And I'm fully in favor of it. I respect everybody that spoke against it, but it's not going to hurt anybody here. It's something that we need. Hey, you want to you want to have a discussion with me, buddy? We could do that. Thank you, Your Honor. I will wrap it up. There was a lot of other people that went a lot further than I'm going to go tonight, and we allowed, allowed them to prattle on. I'm not prattling on. I'm speaking very directly and very plainly as a working guy. 
This is a great project. There's guys here that need these jobs. It's going to create 600 jobs for us, and I'm fully in favor of it. And I thank all you guys for coming out. Next speaker is Aisha Canalos, followed by Melanie Gold. Hi, my name is Asha Canalos. I'm from Minisync, New York. I'm a farmer. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Let me try this way. I'm from Minisync, New York. I'm a farmer. This. Uh, this gas infrastructure that's here in our county is destroying my farm already. So you don't need to face them. Just keep a couple inches away from the microphone. Okay. Okay. And focus on the microphone so your sound okay. is heard. Okay. So the recorder will get your report. Gotcha. That's important. Whatever they hear tonight doesn't matter. It's only what gets into the record. Okay. I do like to make eye contact, though, so people know I'm talking from the heart. Okay. <laughs> I'm here today as a resident of Minisync, the neighboring town. I've been battling the Minisync compressor station along with the other residents of Minisync for nearly three years now. <laughs> okay. All right. Just relax. This is very, you know, upsetting for all of us who have been fighting for so long. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Everything is good? Copacetic? All right, here we go. Okay. I'm here today as a resident of Minisync, who has been battling the Minisync compressor station for nearly three years now. I'm also here as a representative of the organizations Minisync Matters, We the People Matter, Food Not Fracking, and One Billion Rising for Justice. But perhaps most importantly, I'm here as a farmer in the Black Dirt region. I trust that many others will speak to the ill effects and have already of a gas-fired power plant on communities, health of children and families, and incredible risk to the local economy. I'm limiting, I'm limiting my testimony to address the fact that fracked gas power plants and all fracked gas infrastructure, for that matter, are not compatible with agriculture. It's one or the other. There is simply not room for both. Back in 2011, when fellow Minisync organic farmer Deborah Lane and I began researching the effects of compressor stations, pipelines, gas-fired power plants, and other gas infrastructure facilities on agriculture, we found next to nothing. What we did find was isolated to one or two aspects with no cohesive report on effects that a farmer could utilize to better educate and protect themselves from potential threats. I manage a small organic blueberry and, and vegetable farm. Uh, Deborah and her family run an organic grass-fed beef farm. It's been in her family since the 1700s. It's one of the oldest in the States. We both live and work in close proximity to the Minisync compressor station. The Minisync compressor was approved by a slim margin and built last year Although we had begun several new plots and dedicated months to raising our seedlings, my husband and I made the difficult decision to let go of our crops. Working outside, less than a quarter of a mile from the compressor, I was getting sick when venting occurred from the facility, dizziness, nausea, headaches, and then rashes. At one point, I stood up from a sitting position while working and aiming to walk through a doorway, I walked into a wall. Dozens of Minisync residents reported the same symptoms, in addition to sore throats and respiratory irritations and infections that have lasted almost this whole last year. There's, there's a family that lives across the street from the compressor. They have to shut all their, all their windows completely, even in the summer. They have no AC because their children are chronically ill. Um, and just so everyone knows, this, this CP Valley is, is supposed to release 10 times the amount of the very same chemicals. We're already getting sick. My farm is going to be, I won't have a farm if this infrastructure continues. 
And honestly, looking around the room, it breaks my heart to see all you union guys. You're beautiful young guys, and a lot of you look just like friends of mine and people I went to high school with, and I have nothing against you at all. But you're being lied to and manipulated. In Minisync, they told us that they would have all these great union jobs. All these same guys were here. Hi, Todd. How you doing? He sent in letters on behalf of Minisync Compressor Station, Millennium, uh, getting all those union jobs. When the first day of, of con you know, construction started in Minisync, all the trucks that rolled in were from Texas, Kansas, Arkansas, and Florida. We didn't see one from New York. You're being lied to and manipulated, and I don't know why they're wasting your time like that, except that they, they, they can't stand on their own and do it. They can't do their own dirty work. They're getting you to do it. I realized this last spring that I cannot work my farm, will never be able to farm unless we succeed with our case to shut down the mini-sync compressor. Far worse was the realization that our case sets a national precedent with all the attending legal precedent that will either empower other farmers and communities like me and mini-sync or will conversely do the opposite and ensure that farmers all over the country almost immediately feel the pain and anger that I've been feeling. The CPV Valley power plant, if approved, would emit approximately 10 times the amount of the very same contaminants that the mini sink compressor is releasing now, directly into the black dirt region, our most valued, beautiful agricultural land. 60% of our economy in Orange County comes from farms, and they're all in the black dirt region. Wayanda, Goshen, uh, you know, Warwick, uh, mini sink. And, and it's all right here. That's our economy. That's our permanent jobs. It's not, it, you cannot have both. I'm sorry to say that. But the jobs that we need for the people here are, are not, they're not going to be permanent jobs. The permanent jobs would come from sustainable uh, industries like wind and, and water turbines and things like that. This is, this is nothing. This is nothing compared to the loss of property values that we're going to suffer and the health effects that we're already suffering. If people are sick now, if people are getting sick and farms struggling and permanent jobs are in serious risk and home and farm values are already plummeting all as a direct result of this infrastructure that's already here, how could it possibly be justifiable to introduce more of the same infrastructure into the region or any at all? The local people who oppose these projects may be viewed as radical, but how is it radical to fight for our homes, our families' health and well-being, our livelihoods and our farms? It seems far more radical to impose on communities the poisoning of their air, water, food, and soil for corporate profit. In fact, those impositions sound a lot like human and civil rights violations. The Public Service Commission must recognize the devastating consequences of this dangerous plan, which will only do great harm to the middle class families at a time when they most need help and reject this plan on those promises. Thanks. Bravo. Okay, we are quickly running out of time. We have a lot more speakers to get through. I'm going to ask the remaining speakers to keep it much shorter than the other speakers have. The, the idea of this hearing is to get representative comments from all sides, and so nobody should be repeating the same concepts over again. We, we get it, okay? We, we've been through these things enough. So please, if you could, so that everyone who came is going to have a brief chance to say something, if you could speed up your presentations a little bit. Also, if you're, if you're reading something that you could just hand in, it would be much more efficient if you would just hand it in. It's going to be treated the same way because nobody's listening other than me, and I'm just going to be converting everything into a That's summary. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. I'm talking about listening to the audio part, okay? It's a different concept. All right, the next, the next speaker is Melanie Gold, followed by Michael Gatos. Hi. Um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, but I have to face the audience. Can you work with me on this, please? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, just move that thing a little bit over. That's all. Um, uh, I'm a teacher, and um, I'm a really, really big fan of critical thinking. Um, to me, that means thinking that is beyond what's obvious to the point where you figure out who ultimately benefits from something? Who ultimately benefits from the soda can that you're drinking, etc. cetera, okay? Um, I've been a union organizer, and uh, I'm really proud of that. I think unions are the best darn thing in this U.S. of A of ours. Um, and, um, and the reason that they are is because of collective bargaining. That's what happens when people get together, they listen to each other, and they all back something that they all believe in. Um, and that's, that's what we've been doing here, all of us. Um, I'm all for jobs. I'm all for permanent jobs. I would imagine you would be too. These are temporary jobs that you're being offered. Um, I know I'm repeating some of the stuff that's been said, but I'm saying it right off the cuff here. Um, temporary jobs, permanent damage. You gotta weigh that. You gotta figure out who, in the end, is gonna benefit. You might benefit from a job for the next couple of months, next couple of years. But will you then benefit if something like what's happening in North Carolina with the coal and the poisoned water, if something like that happens here or West Virginia, will you benefit from that? Will your job matter at that point? Thank Think you. ahead. Think ahead. Will your job matter when you cannot drink your own water? Thank and you. people who get up here and say that these pseudo experts and words like that, those, that's name calling. I'm sorry. But as a teacher, I can tell you that's name calling. And that's, you know, not really a real discussion. Um, what it does is, is it, it, it boils it down to jobs versus the environment. And you know what? It's not the environment, quote unquote. It's not some separate thing. It's the water you drink and the air you breathe. That's it, very simple. It's the earth you all walk on. Somebody back here rolled their eyes when somebody said that this is five miles from a school. I'm sorry, but your job is just not that much more important than all these kids in a school. <laughs> now, it's great, you're gonna get these jobs. My question is, how are you gonna face your neighbors and your kids who are coughing their brains out when you say, when they say to you, you know, your job actually caused this. Are you going to feel good about that? I don't think you are. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask a question directly of the county legislators and the people in the suits. I'd like to ask you why. Why is it that you can't provide these good people, all of these people, with a job that they can have a clear conscience about? Uh, Michael Gatos, followed by Elizabeth Knight. Good evening. I'll be short, too. Everybody's heard both sides. No matter where this plant would be built, there would be this controversy, and I understand that. I get it, but um, it, it's going to be built, and where it's being proposed all the due diligence I've heard from both sides. I'm not the expert. I'll leave it up to the experts. But our job as Hudson Valley Building Trades, if it's going to be built, it is our job to put our men and women to work. What are you smiling at, all right? I'm not talking to you. All right, if... I'm not, okay. You know, CPV, if they've done their due diligence, the people who are elected, they're the ones you're paying to, to do their job. We're paid to do our job. We're going to put our men and women to work. They have agreed to put local labor to work. That's a fair thing for us. It's about time that we are considered, other than other people from Tennessee come in here, and we don't have jobs. Our taxes go out the window. 
So whether it's CPV or Amy's Kitchen, you'll see us at every job that's proposed. And it's not my job to decide whether it's built or not. My job is to put our men and women to work. Yes, I want to make sure it's safe for the environment. I've heard it all. It's above me. But I do know that the plant that I live next to in dance at Dance Camera, this one is a lot safer. So, you know what? This one does have a lot more amenities to it that does make our environment more safer. And I imagine 80 years from now, there'll be that much more technology that will have the same group of people fighting that. But you know what? That's not up to me. But I do believe that this plant does provide an environmentally safe, compared to other power plants, a lot better. And I am for that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. The next speaker is Elizabeth Knight, I'm right you. followed by Leland Snyder and Todd Diorio. Um, I see a lot of um, a lot of very tall, very good-looking men in T-shirts that say "Safety First" on the back of them. So I believe that that's important to you, as it is to all of us. Before I moved to Orange County about a year and a half ago, I lived in Sullivan County, New York, and I lived in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. In Wayne County, Pennsylvania, there are a number of fracking wells. I have a friend, someone I worked with, who had a small farm next to one of the wells. It spilled everything around it that grew. All the trees were dead. Many people like me think that federal environmental regulations are going to protect human and environmental health from the impacts of fracking. But unfortunately, that's not true. I was shocked to discover that it does not apply to fracking. In 2005, Vice President Dick Cheney, former CEO of Halliburton, the company that introduced the technology that made hydraulic fracturing viable, got federal exemptions from oil and gas drilling from, listen to this list, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and the Community Right to Know Act, among other laws. Since the fracking isn't safe, I don't think the power plant is safe either. And I sat next to somebody tonight and said, well, all this stuff about solar energy is, um, it just isn't workable. Last summer, we put solar panels on our roof. We all know how hot last summer was. I ran my air conditioning. My bill was $19.30 a month. Solar does work. Okay, uh, next speaker is Leland Snyder, followed by Todd Diorio. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm not from Orange County. I am from the southern tier of New York State. I'm familiar with the impact of fracking. And I could tell you that the regulation just is not there right now. For the PSC regulation, there's a compressor in Windsor, and for at least the past year, I don't know, last time I checked six months ago, they have a doc, their documents for their labor saying what chemicals are on site, and it's unfilled out. In fact, all their documents on the entrance to their facility are not filled out, not filled out for an entire year. Now, what chemicals are coming to that site? Well, they're coming from the fracked wells. I appreciate your concern about that, and if you want to leave a statement about that compressor, we'll take it back. I'll, but I need you to stay. I'll be very brief. Tonight's okay. Hearing, okay. Right. Uh, I I urge you to not grant a certificate of light and regulatory regime. The prices for gas have gone from thirteen dollars to two dollars at the wellhead, or two thirty, and the prices for the consumer have not dropped to that level. There's obviously some place where there's monopoly practices in, in place, and I urge you not to grant light and regulatory regime. We need to see what's going on. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, Todd DiOrio followed by Christopher Cerrone, followed by Peter Becker. I'm not sure if I'm the good looking union guy or the guy in the suit. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> um, I'm Todd DiOrio, President of Hudson Valley Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, the council consists of 28 construction trade locals and over 10,000 members. I think we have a lot in common here. There's a lot of conversation today. I know you guys have supported us. It seems like there's a lot of people in this room that support local unions, but it seems like one thing people don't understand, I'm going off my prepared speech a little bit, is all our jobs are temporary. We live, unfortunately, off of temporary jobs. Not too many constructions in the building trades work steady unless you work for a company that does heavy highway and you're constantly. We go from six months with one company, six months to another. When a power plant comes in, we build it. The school construction comes, we build it. So that's what people got to understand. We actually, we rely on these temporary jobs sometimes. We don't consider them temporary. Believe me, we wish they were full-time jobs. I support teachers. I wish we had full-time jobs um, that we, you know, would, we don't have paid vacation. We don't have sick days. We don't have a lot of stuff that some of the unions have. We, we were in a different world, and I don't think people realize that sometimes. I just want to touch on a couple things that were brought up real quickly. Minnesink Valley Compressor Station, I know people said they've seen people from Tennessee. 90% of the laborers on that job, construction workers, were local. We had an agreement with Minnesink. I'm, I'm telling you, I can show you the, well, I'm not going to debate you. Same thing with CPV, we have a commitment to them. Um, future projects, you guys are in support of us. There's a lot of projects that come out that are controversial sometimes, out of town workers, out of state workers. I'd love to have your support. The next time there's the thing, I, I welcome you guys to come in and meet with me and some of the officers, officers and talk about it in the future. But um, I, th I thank the opportunity to speak here tonight. I'm here in support of CPV Valley Energy Center as it relates to requirements under the New York State Public Service Commission of the Public Convenience and Necessity. This project is vitally needed to help meet the electric power needs of the fast-growing Hudson Valley. This need has been confirmed by the New York State Electric Grid Operator. CPV is a community partner. They have secured many of the required approvals and permits. They have made a financial investment in the project as well as the community. They have made a commitment to local labor, ensuring good wages and benefits through a project labor agreement. They have received support from former Orange County Executive and current Orange County Executive Steve Newhouse, and I believe all of our state and federal elected officials who cover Orange County also support this project. This project is expected to cost over $800 million to construct. It will employ hundreds of local union construction workers during construction over the expected 30 months of construction during a time of high unemployment in the construction trades in the Hudson Valley. This will be a much needed economic boom to Orange County. The plant's design incorporates the latest in state and art technology. I'm not going to go into everything. We've already heard it a hundred times over. But based upon the criteria outlined in the uh, Public Service Commission's notice of public statement hearing and procedural conference issued January 24, 2014, and the above information, we believe the CPV Valley should be granted the certificate so that this important project may move into the construction and begin delivering benefits to the citizens of New York State. Thank you. The next speaker is Christopher Cerrone, followed by Peter Becker and Madeline Shaw. Good evening, my name is Christopher Cerrone and I am a member of Laborers Local 17 in Newburgh, New York. I am here tonight to ask the Commission to approve the Certificate of Authority for CPV Valley LLC to own, operate, and begin construction of electric plant as an electric corporation regulated by the Commission. <clears throat> this project has been reviewed under secret by the Town of Way Way On to Planning Board as lead agency and on February 8, 2012, have an accepted FEIS final environmental impact statement and adopted a finding statement on May 23, 2012. CPV LLC has committed to investing private funds and to paying a pilot payment in lieu of taxes, which will help reduce the tax burden for Orange County residents as well as establishing the clean energy source that we have all been searching for for decades. Additionally, approval of the Certificate of Authority will make way for much ne needed good paying construction jobs during the construction phase in addition to plant operations jobs once the facility is up and running, not to mention the ancillary jobs and local business growth, growth that will result from this project. I wish to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight 
and to convey my support of this project. And again, I urge you to approve the Certificate of Authority for CPV LLC. Thank you. Next speaker is Peter Becker, followed by Madeline Shaw, followed by Dorothy Winner. Is Peter Becker here? Okay, let's go to Madeline Shaw then. Please keep it brief. I will. I thank all of you for your eloquence. I'm nowhere near that that level. Um, when I moved up here as a as a child of eight, we used to come up for weekends. A very naive child of eight, I said, the Ridgeberry, they'll never find us if they want to drop a bomb. That was, that was my thinking at the age of eight. Well, the bomb has dropped. It's dropped all over. We go into the grocery store. We can't buy food without knowing whether it's GMO or not. Our, our water is getting polluted. Our air now is getting polluted. I love you unions. I'm a member of two unions myself. Believe me, I would love to see you working all the time. But the damage that this plant will do, and these are temporary jobs, the, the, the consequences of what this plant is going to produce is going to change all of our lifestyles. My first thought about coming up here, all I wanted to do was ask one question, which seems very uh, self-centered at this point, but I think it's a question we all have to ask. I'm very sensitive to industrial, even cleaning supplies. I have problems breathing if I get too close. And when I can't breathe and I have to move, is Mr. Rosano going to buy my house? Is Mr. Cole going to buy my house? Are the owners of this plant going to buy my house? And we all are going to have to ask these questions, these poor people in West Town. I, have, I feel my heart goes out to you. My heart goes out to you. You were so eloquent. And I just ask the Public Service Commission to please serve the public. Next speaker is Dorothy Winner, followed by John Dixon, followed by Pramila Malik. I like breathing very much. <laughs> I imagine all of you also do that. And I like drinking clean water. And I hope that you have clean water where you live. Uh, I live in Weiwianda. Right now the air is okay to breathe, I'm all right. The water isn't so good. We have a lot of problems with our water. Um, all I can say is I wish everybody clean air and water. John Dixon, Pramila Malik, and Carol Smith. Okay, Mr. Dixon has passed. Thank you. This is Pramila Malik. Hey, how you guys doing? Did you find your way here okay? Did you get good directions and everything? Your navigator got you here all right? Um, so, um, regarding jobs, I would like to ask you, where are you going to work when you get sick? Or when your kids get sick? Um, and you have to take time off from work. Um, and don't our jobs matter as well? My name is Pramila Mullick. I live in the neighboring community of Minisink, New York, and represent a grassroots community organization known as Stop MCS, as well as Protect Orange County. I want to first start by protesting a little bit that this meeting, as much as I support union workers, and I myself was a shop steward at one point, I, I protest that this meeting is occupied by people who have pretty much been told to be here by their employers and who don't 
probably have any idea what this project really entails. While impacted residents are standing in the corner and on the floor, um, that's unconscionable. Like, I don't know if Robin is still here, but Robin Freund, my neighbor from Minisync, um, a mom and a widow who lost her husband on 9-11, was standing in the corner with no place to sit. Um, this is not how a meeting should be conducted. And we're kind of tired of this, this uh, road show. I do want to thank the Public Service Commission for holding the hearing. Although this process began in 2008, this, this hearing is actually long overdue. And it's the first time a state agency has actually come to our local community to listen to the people who will be impacted by this project. And unfortunately, so far, the scale and magnitude of this project has been inversely proportional to the extent that the public has been allowed to participate due to the decisions by the lead agency as well as other involved agencies. Because to this day, there are still many, many people who will be directly impacted by this project and still do not know about it. My neighbor, Joan, who spoke earlier, um, lives in the town of Sl Slate Hill. She's been there for almost 23 years and she just came to know about this recently. There are residents who actually participated in the scoping meeting in 2008 who did not know that this project was mo moving forward in the permitting process. Why? Because there was little effort or outreach on the part of the lead agency and the project sponsor, CPV, to inform the public. When the mini sink compressor station was proposed in 2011, the project sponsor was required to inform every resident within, living within a half mile. Here, we have a project nearly 10 times the size with 10 to 40 times the impacts. And who were the residents who actually received a notification in the mail? Residents living just within 500 feet. And when did they receive their first notification? In 2013, five years after the process began. Such as another Slate Hill resident, Adriana Groinston, who's also here tonight an elderly citizen who lives directly across the street from the proposed site. And what about all the people in the direct impact zone as defined by the project sponsor of five miles, such as the folks in Goshen directly downwind of this facility, or all the black dirt farmers who will see their soil depleted and crops diminish as a result of this facility. These people at the very least deserve indeed have the right to be part of this process. The public has completely lost faith. Obscure and vague notices giving the public 10 days to respond to what the project sponsors have had an army of lobbyists and lawyers and experts working on for years? Where's the fairness in this? 10 days for busy, hardworking middle-class moms and dads to learn how to articulate their desperate concerns within the framework of the legal and statutory requirements? And those are just the ones lucky enough to have seen that one day's notice in the paper. What language do we speak in to communicate to the PSC? That we will lose our homes, our way of life, everything we've worked for our entire lives. We're not a billion dollar corporation. But why do we have to choose either walking away from our homes or allowing our children to live in harm's way? 10 days to submit comments that will never be addressed or answered in any meaningful way, 10 days to learn the complexities of our state and federal environmental laws, or in this case, public service law. We know where the lawyers for the company are. They're in Albany, lobbying away to, to ensure that they get the approvals they need. But where are the lawyers for the people to ensure our needs and our rights are safeguarded? We need a public, ombudsman to represent our concerns, our issues, and our needs. But unfortunately, there is none for impacted communities, so we're left on our own. There is none, and therefore we ask you to at the very least extend the comment period for at least 30 days and notify the public of that process. 
and we further request a technical conference with the PSC to understand the many documents submitted by the project sponsor, the issues the PSC will address, and to understand the scientific and technical basis for the claims made in the project sponsor's petition. We note that the PSC does hold technical conferences with industry. It is imperative that the PSC restore some integrity to this process, and granting these two requests would go a long way towards that goal. And I would add one more thing. We have submitted a letter requesting at least one more public hearing, and I would really like to, the PSC to ensure that we have a public hearing where impacted residents can really articulate their concerns. Before I go into the narrow issues that the PSC will review, I would like to remind everyone exactly what this project entails. Competitive Power Ventures Holdings, a venture capital firm based in Maryland, plans to construct a new 630 to 650 megawatt facility in Orange County. <coughs> Randy's already mentioned that it would include a 965 gallon diesel fuel storage tank as well as a 19,000 gallon ammonia tank. The natural gas would be transported by the Millennium Pipeline. The project would be built on a pristine greenfield site in a protected agricultural district, over 60 acres of federally designated wetlands. It's also within an endangered species habitat over an existing fault line on top of a sole source aquifer and adjacent to a low income housing, public housing project and on top of a Native American burial ground. The project would be a new source of 2.2 million tons of greenhouse gases in New York State. It is important to understand this because this is the context in which the public need and necessity must be evaluated. And for those of you scratching your head wondering how a project with such widespread impacts has gotten this far, I would warn you that this is what happens when a local town board is named lead agency and that town's attorney becomes the project sponsor's attorney, which again describes the complete lack of integrity this entire project has had. Now we're told that in fact the capacity of the plant would be 820 megawatts, not 630. This is a 30% increase in its capacity. This means a 30% increase in its emissions and other environmental impacts. This, I would like to restate, requires a supplemental EIS. The PSC should suspend review of this permit pending the completion of the supplemental EIS. And now, <clears throat> I would hope that despite the narrow scope of the issues the PSC is looking at, any decision or review it makes would be consistent with our state's energy law. So I'll cite just one section from Article 3 that our state's energy plan must, along with other things, quote, protect its environmental values and agricultural heritage, to husband its resources for future generations, and to promote the health and welfare of its people. The second section in Article 3 goes on to state that every agency of the state shall conduct its affairs so as to conform to the state energy policy expressed in this chapter. Therefore, I submit that the public health and environmental issues should be on the table. And I, I will be submitting to the PSC expert reports on all of these issues. That includes a report by former EPA scientist Wilma Subra on the public health impacts of this project in which she states that the emissions will be 43 times that of the mini-sync compressor station. I will include a report by a geologist identifying a fault line going directly through the site. A report by an ecologist documenting endangered species habitat. And a letter by the Ramapo Lenape tribe describing the cultural resources on the property, including a Native American burial ground. Article 6 goes on to restate the same requirements as Article 3. Therefore, I submit that it is part of the PSC mandate to consider all these issues in its review in accordance with Article 3 and Article 6 of the state energy law. Now for the narrow issues defined by Section 68 and 69 of the Public Service Law. 
Okay, I mean, these are substantive, important issues. We are here to take testimony. That's my understanding. I don't think anyone has gone into this, but I will. I will try to wrap it up quickly. Is there a need for this project? Absolutely, categorically not. When I first received notice of the mini sink compressor station plans that has now devastated my community, I asked local officials why this was being built, and I was told from day one this is to close down Indian Point. And of course, we all agree Indian Point should be closed down. But why on earth would they shut down one public health and safety hazard just to replace it with another? Well, the truth is that New York doesn't need Indian Point nor CPV to replace Indian Point because we don't even use most of the power produced by Indian Point. Indian Point produces about 2,000 megawatts of power, and I cite a 2010 news article which states that due to deregulation, most of that power is sold to New England, entitled, quote, New York relying much less on Indian Point for energy. It goes on to say, quote, Entergy Nuclear has dropped its share of electricity supporting New York City and Westchester County to about 4% of the area's power needs, while selling increasing portions of its energy in an open market stretching from Maine to Delaware. This company, is, it goes on to add, this company is spending millions of dollars on an extensive campaign to convince the public that the region would suffer if the nuclear plant at Indian Point were shut and its 2,100 megawatts were withdrawn. Simultaneously, however, Entergy is withdrawing all but 560 megawatts and is selling the rest <laughs> elsewhere through the interconnecting New England, New York, Mid-Atlantic, Quebec, and Ontario power grids. Although they refuse to disclose exactly how much energy they do sell in New York, given the trends in the energy market, it is likely now much less than it was in 2010. And we see that CPV seems to be following in their footsteps, trying to pull off the same public deception. Many others he have given you even more reasons as to why we don't need this power plant, how efficiency upgrades would provide any energy we might need. We have power plants closing all over the state for just recently, all of whom stated in their bankruptcy papers that they have lost money for the last 10 years in a row and were operating at only 25% capacity. And the public is on to these devious deceptions and false forecasts. I can I just address the issue of jobs? It's very short. It's just five seconds. I'm sorry. You have gone on now for about eight or nine minutes, which is three times, quiet please, which is three times the limit that I gave you. Does anybody, does anybody want to? Now, look, understand, she's going to be submitting this comment in writing. Uh, so her full comment is going to go into the record, okay? Your speaking it tonight doesn't accomplish anything different. Okay. I have one short, quick paragraph on the issue of jobs that I would like to talk about, and that's it. And then I Can't you? I think that's what you can can you give it to us in one sentence? Just summarize it in one sentence. It, it's, it's a very tiny paragraph. It will take literally 10 seconds. Okay, I just want to talk briefly on the issue of jobs because this issue has come up quite a bit tonight. Um, everybody's talked about the fact that it'll be temporary jobs. Also, because of the FERC approved rate increases 6 to 15 percent that CPV is relying on to pay for construction, we will drive out many businesses who will then find more affordable parts of the state and the country to move in. Thirdly, I submit that investments in renewable energy is even a bigger job creator than fossil fuels without any of the environmental risk and bur burdens. And I cite a University of Massachusetts study which states, and I'll end after this, quote, spending a given amount of money on clean energy investment agenda generates approximately 3.2 times the number of jobs within the United States as does the spending the same amount of money within the fossil fuel sector. Thank you.
The next speaker is Carol Smith. Good evening. I'm Carol Smith, Vice President for Government at the Orange County Chamber of Commerce. We represent approximately 1,600 businesses in Orange County and the surrounding area. The Chamber has been working with CP Valley for the last five years. Um, during that time, the company has developed the project, secured all of the required approval and permits, um, and have also had a significant financial investment. There is no doubt in our mind that their business entity was properly formed. Um, we also have heard tonight that the CP Valley has obtained all the municipal consents from the city of Middletown that it needs to, to do. Um, I urge the Public Service Commission to grant CP Valley the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity and allow this vitally important infrastructure project to proceed, hopefully breaking ground very soon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak once again in support of this project. Thank you. Um, for anybody that I'm forced to cut off, if you want to wait till the end after everybody else has spoken, I may have some time left if uh, we don't get kicked out of the building. The next speaker is James Petro, followed by Kathy Scafidis and Scafidis and Christopher McCracken. I'm Jim Petro. I'm the executive director of the Orange County IDA. We've uh, been working with uh, CPV for a little over five years, early 2008. We spent endless hours working on the uh, pilot agreement. Um, I think it's through the efforts of the IDA to attract this company to our area that approximately 600 people will be working for two years. And I think that everybody on the board would agree with me that we're in 100% agreement that this is a great project for the area, and we're very happy to have them here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good evening. My name is Kathy Baker Scafidis. I'm a resident of Warwick, New York. Um, I have an environmental degree. I've worked in the New York and New Jersey Highlands and um, all over New Jersey and New York for um, about 18 years now. Um, I, I was the executive director of Orange Environment. I've taken a leave for a few years to be a mom, um, and I've lived up here in Orange County for almost 12 years now. Um, According to the EPA, Orange County is currently in non-attainment for fine particulate matter air pollution. Um, as such, uh, parts per million, 2.5 pollution is a serious and growing health risk for Orange County residents. EPA's own research highlights the dangers to human health posed by particulate matter. Particulate matter has been linked to a range of serious respiratory health problems. The key health effect categories associated with ambient particulate matter include premature mortality, aggravation of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, um, aggravated asthma, acute respiratory symptoms included aggravated coughing, a difficult or painful breathing, chronic bronchitis, and de decreased lung function that can be experienced as shortness of breath. Um, we have been out of compliance in Orange County for over 20 years. We have other uh, air quality concerns. The plant will be located in a federal air quality non-attainment area for ozone and certain particulate matter. It is proposed that the plant will purchase non-attainment emissions offsets for nitrogen oxide and volatile organic compounds. However, these may be traded across state lines. The air quality in and around Weyweyanda in Orange Co County likely will suffer from further de deterioration unless, unless it is ensured that offsets are available and purchased in a manner such that existing emissions from sources in the Weyweyanda area are reduced in appropriate amounts. We know this will not happen. Similar, similarly, the plant will have to purchase allowances for its sulfur dioxide emissions. Once again, unless corresponding local reduction of existing emissions of this irritating and acid rain contributing gas are achieved, the air quality in and around Weyweyanda will deteriorate. The plant will emit various gases, some in greater quantity than others. 
All of these gases, however, will have a cumulative effect over time on Weiwayanda's air quality, with sources from new business development and or increased transportation that is likely to occur, occur in the future in Weiwayanda. The cumulative impacts of these sources taken together likely will be significant for most, if not all, of the gases listed in all of the CPV's reports. This will be so even if no single source is considered significant. Therefore, all the plant's emissions, even those that meet present standards, could very well have a role in causing air quality deterioration in the future. When this point is reached, it may be necessary for the area to curb further development, even of the type that otherwise would be considered very desirable. Um, greenhouse gases. The greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases that will be <coughs> emitted thereby contributing to global warming are problematic. It is claimed that the plant will add 0.037 to the national emissions of carbon dioxide. This seems large for a single source when you consider that there are millions of sources nationwide. Never nevertheless, it is claimed that the plant is a step forward since it will displace energy sources that emit more carbon dioxide. The problem is that even assuming that this is true now, will it remain true for years to come? Um, the plan is projected to have a 30-year life. With, with the ever-accelerating development of green technology, it could be that this plant will be considered a dinosaur long before it is taken um, offline. <clears throat> it would then be a liability with, with regard to global warming. Ammonia. Ammonia will be used to control some of the plant's emissions. During this process, some of the ammonia will slip into the air. This should be of some concern, perhaps of greater concern. However, is the storage of ammonia on site, which originally in the DEIS was 15,000 gallon tank, and now it's a 19,000 gallon tank. When ammonia at a 20% concentration is stored, the Clean Air Act and federal regulations require that a catastrophic release model be developed. However, the plant will avoid this by, requiring, uh, by requirements by using a 19% concentration. This smacks of attempting to fly under the radar. If indeed this was the tactic, then it is disappointing and justifiably raises a concern whether safety was of the highest priority in this project planning. Whether a catastrophic release model should be required needs to be examined since the concentration is borderline. Water resources. There is no real discussion and or examination of impacts to local groundwater resources or potable water sources in and around the applicant's property if there is ever a contamination leak from the diesel, ammonia, or other specified contaminants planned to be stored on the property and used in the day-to-day -day or quarterly biannually use of the power plant operations. Um, we are concerned with preventing contamination to these significant resources and feel the applicant has not adequ adequately addressed resource protection and mitigation possibilities from if contamination arises. As far as our environment is concerned, we proposed during the last master plan review in Weiwianda um, over seven years ago that the town of Weiwianda should adopt more stringent watershed and river protection buffers and wellhead protection ordinances because at this community, as this community continues to grow and possibly allow for expansion of heavier industrial operations like this plant, natural resource protection needs to be increased as well. As far as we know, more stringent resource protection ordinances have not been adopted locally to date. Um, the residents of Orange County know that there is no need for electrical energy proposed to be generated by the CP Valley Energy Center and that there is no energy sh shortage to support the issuance of a certificate of convenience and necessity for this project. And we are hopeful that the planned regional transmission upgrades will remedy the present delivery congestion, equalize the supply and demand equation, and facilitate the transfer of lower costs from upstate electricity into our, re uh, into our region. Our economy continues to be at an all-time low, and now you're asking residents to foot the bill. It's absolutely insane. Sustainability and greening up our communities have become important words for many communities and businesses worldwide over the past decade. CPV mentions in their documents that this facility could take offline other higher contaminating, bigger greenhouse gas guzzlers who have been operating in our area and generating energy for some time. This, of course, is no re there, there, of course, is no regional or statewide effort to take older facilities offline at the moment. So when this applicant talks ab about burning greener than others in the area by using natural gas, we would like to see this facility take its green talk further because burning natural gas and diesel is not a carbon neutral activity, which meets uh, New York State's new criteria for climate change. Um, 
CPV cannot proceed with their proposed power plant without government tax and ratepayer subsidies, and they require a payment in lieu of taxes agreement from the town of Wayweon to offset county, local, and property taxes at the expenses of residents. It's absolutely ludicrous. It is therefore incumbent upon the Public Service Committee to decide in favor of the people of the state of New York. It is incumbent upon the, the PSC to deny CPV Valley, the requested certificate of conveyance of necessity pursuant to section 68. Um, the PSC must determine that such construction is convenient and necessary for this public service and that this facility will be safe, adequate, and reliable service and provide just and reasonable rates and whether issuance of a certificate is in the public interest. To this date, they have not met any of these criteria. Thank you. The next speaker is Christopher McCracken. Uh, good evening. Thanks to the Public Service Commission for taking the time to hear everyone's comments tonight. Uh, my name is Chris McCracken. I work for Advanced Testing. We are a uh, Orange County based business, been here for about 30 years. And um, over the past few years, we've seen this project progress. We've attended most of the public hearings. We've been, attended their outreach events. Uh, and we asked to meet with them one-on-one -on -one to get more information about the project. And they were very willing to do that. And we sat with them and we spent a good part of a day talking about the project with them. So we feel like they've made a pretty significant effort to inform those and do their part to answer questions and, and concerns as much as uh, asked of them. Um, as far as the project goes, um, we feel there are a number of positive benefits to this project and we support it wholeheartedly. Uh, and we ask the commission to approve this certificate. Um, first of all, there's the obvious component of the power generation. Um, whether the power is uh, needed immediately or in the long run, we feel like this facility will allow uh, Orange County and the state to remain uh, a business leader. Uh, energy and power is something we all need, we all rely on, whether the services are local or uh, statewide or nationwide. Uh, this is something we rely on to maintain our position in, uh, in the area and in the region. Um, we know there's development uh, ongoing. There are many developments in the metropolitan area and surely in Orange County to come. And uh, power generation like this is reliable and necessary. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a natural gas facility. Uh, natural gas uh, is uh, a cleaner generation, uh, fuel generation, um, cleaner than uh, coal and oil, uh, two of the other three uh, leading uh, fuel sources in the U.S. Uh, and uh, natural gas is, uh, the large majority of it is acquired from the United States, thereby reducing our reliance on foreign fuels uh, as well. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, this is a, a significant construction project for the area. Um, there are not projects of this size that come along very often in Orange County. Uh, and like Todd mentioned this, uh, or like everyone mentioned, but like Todd said, uh, all construction projects are, are temporary. Uh, my family is a construction background and uh, my father just went from job to job to job, and that's what you do in the construction industry. Um, and some are more temporary than others. Um, some people are constructing sidewalks for a week at a time, but that's what they do. Um, and they make a life out of it. Uh, other people, uh, and this project, things like this, uh, are almost as far from temporary as far as the construction industry is concerned. Uh, and this will put a lot of people to work for a long time and will be a really positive uh, uh, force for, for the local labor and suppliers, material suppliers, service providers like ours. Um, and whether we're uh, guaranteed the, the, the work or not, uh, at least there's opportunity locally now. Um, so for all those reasons, we are asking the commission to approve CPV's certificate. Thank you. Okay, the next three speakers are James Stack, Jerome Spector and Scott Perry. I'm Mr. Stack. Uh, whoops, judge. Uh, judge, right? I wouldn't want your job. Stress. You're better off going to uh, California and work for Google. I don't have any stress. I love all your people. 
Oh, uh, I don't want to say. I, I, I ain't talking. I don't want to. Listen, I want to know. I don't know you the uh, magnitude. I use these 50 cent college words. Magnitude of 600. And, is it 650 or 860 megawatts? What is it? Would you know? I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to hear your comments. It's not meant to be a dialogue. You have to make your comments. Who do I mention the questions to then? Uh, there are people here from the applicant. There are people here from the staff of the Department of Public Service. They might be able to answer your questions. The, the lady at the table, you mean? There's, there's other people here, too. If you ask her, she'll find them for you. No, because I, my little 80-acre farm, this is 120 acres, right? I've been working on this for two years. I got approval to put 12 megawatts, which is about 10,200 homes on my little farm. I live in town of Walkville. But the thing is that, you know, the magnitude of, it's, it's, it's horrendous. I didn't, I'm, I'm for the project, don't get me wrong. But who's going to buy this stuff? Who's, you know, I'm not like asking the question. I'm just here to <coughs> objection, so I take the different approach. Who's going to, who's going to fund this? Microsoft or somebody like that? They got the money. Who? It's not for me to say. Is that, are you, are you serious or what? How do you know that? I'm not trying to question. I mean. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to hear your comments and to have your concerns addressed to the commission. Okay? It, it's, this is not a give and take a question and answer session. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you, if you have a comment to make, please make it. Otherwise, we're going to move on okay. to somebody else, okay? Okay. Somebody hot air here. No, I'm for the project. That's, thank you. Please. Okay. Jerome Spector followed by Scott Perry. Hi, my name is Jerome Spector. Uh, I'm here representing Orange Environment, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Michael Edelstein, who's the president of Orange Environment. Can't hear you. Okay. My initial comments in this matter address OE's perspective. The PSC has the responsibility for issuing, quote, a certificate of public convenience and necessity for the CPV project after due hearing. The PSC must accordingly determine that such construction or such exercise of the right, privilege, or franchise is convenient and necessary for the public service. In making such a determination, the Commission shall consider, among other factors, the corporation's ability to render safe, adequate, and reliable service and provide just and reasonable rates and whether issuance of a certificate is in the public interest. With regard to item one above, OE submits that there has been no due hearing on this matter. The Environmental Impact Assessment Review under CEQRA was conducted by the local municipality which lacked resources, objectivity, and experience to manage a review of a project of this scope and potential impact. As a result, we did not find the process to be thorough and the resulting review was shallow. Opportunities to participate were minimal and did not afford us the full potential to contribute. We and other local organizations did not find the lead agency to be responsive to process or substantive comment. Given the enormity of potential consequence, we do not believe that an adequate record was created on a variety of issues that pertain to the potential for hazards to the community, a lack of need, a selection of best alternative, or an appreciation of potential impacts to the local communities. Given the deficient process and record created, we do not believe that the PSC can authenticate that the standard of due hearing has been achieved. With regard to item two above, we do not believe that the record demonstrates that the proposed CPV plant is necessary for the public service. In the matter of the Calpine application, nearly two decades ago, Orange Environment took the position that natural gas was then only a trans transitional fuel with regard 
to a shift to renewable energy to be achieved within a 20-year period. Part of our settlement with Calpine involved fostering this shift over the projected 20-year life of that plant. In 2014, our view is the same. However, we are looking at CPV at the point when the transition was to be complete and when our investments now should be directly and directed entirely to the renewable energy alternative that was ill-considered by the CPV review. It is instructive that all responsible parties addressing climate change target at a minimum a 20 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. At the same time, the Stanford University report lead authored by Jacobson shows that renewable energy can be the basis by 2030 of New York electricity, heat and transportation energy needs if we direct investment to this alternative. In short, while Calpine might have proposed a reasonable transition strategy in 1995, we cannot look the same way at CPV in 2014. In 2014, the need and this, the public service and public interest, is to see all investments made in renewable energy development. By the time CPV comes online, the time for fossil fuel power plants will have eclipsed. As Howard Kunstler, among others, has warned, we may well find ourselves without the investment capital and wherewithal to fully make a renewable transition. No investments in fossil fuel plants should be approved. CPV is not the best alternative to make up New York's need for base and transition energy. With regard to item three above, the matter of safety, economy, and rates and public is interest are raised. I recently hosted programs here in Orange, Orange County and in New Jersey where the overall safety of gas, gas infrastructure was discussed. It was interesting that, first of all, the current literature demonstrates that gas involves many layers of issues, fire, explosion, accident potential, leakage, greenhouse gas contamination, and particularly when backup systems are considered toxic contamination and air pollution. And secondly, compounding the interest was the fact that CPB disclosed and discussed few, if any, of these hazard and health issues in their documentation reviewed in Weiwayanda. During the Calpine hearing, Orange Environment presented extensive testimony by George Thurston and Ramona Lal of the New York University School of Public Health. This testimony demonstrated there are complex cumulative air pollution issues and health concerns in the microregion where CPV will be located and that will be exacerbated by a gas-fired power plant. Downwind communities including Middletown, Goshen, Warwick, Chester, Florida, and others will be placed at increased risk of disease. In Orange Environment's settlement with Calpine, Calpine agreed to fund research by Orange Environment into cumulative air pollution impacts and for mitigatory strategies. The region is out of compliance with the Clean Air Act on at least two national ambient air quality standards in any case. The contribution of CPV to compounding that issue needs to be understood. A further innovation in the Calpine permit that came out of the OE settlement was a parties of interest process that gave local residents access to the plant and the owners and regulators on a regular basis to review air and other environmental performance measures and the clout to force mitigation or closure if such problems were not adequately addressed. Issues of economy and rates are also not addressed. Even with shale gas, there remains an amazing volatility in the gas industry and in rates for consumers. Again, in comparison to renewable energy investments, there is not a clear case for gas. This issue is not critically examined in the review. Economics was a crucial factor in the defeat of a gas-fired plant proposal in Middletown in early 1990s. It should be added that when externalities are added, there is not a favorable comparison between natural gas and renewable energy. There is a good likelihood that fracking will not occur in New York for this reason, and that it will eventually be curtailed or required to cover external costs, pollution liabilities, etc. elsewhere. These factors should be considered in granting a license to CPV. Finally, cumulative of those other factors is the public interest serving by issuing a permit to CPV. The question here includes this issue of light review. 
In our perspective, light review is never in the public interest, and given the preponderance of unresolved issues here, it is certainly not appropriate here. Rather, PSC should hold an issues hearing and commence, commence an administrative review on the questions listed here. We believe that the preponderance of evidence will rule out this project at this time, and it will direct our attention to the renewable energy alternative discussed by Jacobson, which we believe can be further improved by programs of community-based, decentralized, and distributed energy, building buildings that are energy neutral or positive and dramatically rethinking our transportation, agriculture, and industrial sectors. We look forward to laying this pathway out in an administrative hearing. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Perry, followed by Susan Hito Shapiro and Evelyn, and I'm sorry I can't read your last name. Hello, I'm Scott Perry. I'm a Goshen resident, and I also own and represent a Goshen business, Atlas Security Guard Services. I'm Scott Perry. I'm a Goshen resident, and I also represent Atlas Security Services. We're a Goshen, we're a Goshen based security guard services company and we want to voice our support in favor of the project. We see this as pro-growth, the kind of growth that uh, sparks job creation. Uh, without that job creation, my company's stagnant and my workers uh, suffer. Um, more importantly, um, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a property owner, I'm a horse owner. Uh, the environment's important to me. I wouldn't trade that for any business gain. And I think the rest of the men and women uh, who uh, voiced their support of the project also feel the same way. Uh, so I'm strongly in su support of the project, and I'd like to see it get built. Susan Hito Shapiro. Hi, thank you for um, holding this hearing. I am here um, as a Goshen resident, as a farmer in Goshen, and as an uh, environmental attorney. I'm also here representing the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater uh, as a board member. Um, you may be aware that Clearwater's uh, mission is to pre preserve and protect the Hudson River, its tributaries, and related water bod bodies. Clearwater has spent the past several years actively participating in the Mid-Hudson Regional Sustainability Plan focusing on energy working groups. This, through this process of our, and our Green Cities initiative, we have actively been promoting the transition to a green energy economy, which combines energy efficiency and a balanced portfolio of renewable energy generations to reduce our car carbon footprint and create sustainable jobs. In this view, there's, we have a grave concerns about CPV's proposal. Uh, not the least of which is the discharge of gray water from the city of Middletown sewer power plant that will be used for the cooling process at the CPV plant and will go into the Wallkill River, river and which, will, which is already a compromised water body and which will impact down river issues, including the Hudson River. Clearwater opposes the issuance of a certificate of convenience and necessity because CPV has not adequately demonstrated the need for this project. Uh, this natural gas-powered energy, nor any gas-powered energy, is not necessary in the Hudson Valley to replace the, uh, the energy provided by Indian Point in the Lower Hudson Valley. As amply documented by the Synapse Energy Economics Report, there is no need for this plant. According to the New York State Independent Service Operator, New York State's energy generating capacity currently exceeds its demand, so there is no need for this electricity propo proposed to be generated by the CPV. The bigger problem in New York State is an imbalance of power supply and demand, and that is being addressed right now by the government, governor's energy highway blueprint, which will address the current delivery congestion, equalize the supply and demand equation, and facilitate the transfer of lower cost upstate electricity, wind power, into our region. Thus there is no need for CPV. There are better alternatives, in fact. If, if we decide we need even more energy, as many people have cited the Jacobson study, there are many other ways that we can 
provide additional energy to our region. We have the ability to increase our wind, geothermal, solar capabilities over the long term. In fact, right now in Otisville, there's solar production going on. The fact that no one's even mentioning that Orange County, with our wonderful workers who could have permanent jobs building solar uh, and geothermal and wind components, that would be permanent jobs for our workers, rather than this temporary building of a plant that will only endanger our health, our lives, our farms, and our community. Um, they're building in Otisville solar panels for the military in a prison. We should, be do, we should have our general workers be building that for the public. We are here in the Hudson Valley. We have New York City. If we put municipal, on every municipal building and school in our region, if we covered them with solar, we would have no need for this plant. We already don't have a need. We'd have less of a need even then. Clearwater opposes the issuance of a certificate of convenience and necessity because the proposed CPV project will have negative economic impacts. CPV cannot and will not proceed with their proposed power plant without government tax and ratepayer subsidies. CPB requires a payment in lieu of tax and a pilot agreement from Orange County and the town of Weiweyanda to offset county, local, and property obligations. There are many examples, including Bowline in Havistraw in North Rockland, that have gone belly up, Dan Scammer. And what happens with these pilot plants is, yes, they pay less taxes up front, and at the end of the day, who's left holding the bag? The public, the ratepayers. And then the taxes go through the roof. Our property taxes will be unacceptably high and will cause enormous economic grief and stress on all of our community for the benefit of an out-of-state company that will sh shows no long-term commitment to our community. Because if they did, they wouldn't be asking for a pilot program now, and they'd be paying for it up front. FERC has uh, created a new capacity zone, which if not halted, would increase the electricity bills of our region up to 6 to 15 percent in May 2014. It, uh, it, that could actually result in increasing our, our costs of t up to 25 percent uh, over the next few years, plus a half a million dollars over a three-year period for this project. Uh, the cost of construction of the CPV c facility will be passed on to us, the ratepayers. When you add construction costs, IDA in incentives, and cost increases, the economic hardships of this project for our region are unacceptable. The jobs, as, as has been stated by other people, the University of Massachusetts and others have found that investment in solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, pretty much almost any form of energy besides uh, fossil fuel based and nuclear creates more jobs. Energy transmission, uh, many other uh, uh, retrofitting homes, all of that creates permanent long term jobs and we actually uh, save money that way. Clearwater opposes the issuance of a certificate of convenience and necessity because the proposed CPV project will have a negative environment imp impact and will ac ac acerbate the climate crisis. By Burning more fossil fuels, all we're doing is creating a bigger carbon footprint. We're not solving the problem. It, we are, we're going to be putting up, this plant will put 2.2 million tons more of CO2 into the environment. And it will put 500 tons of known carcinogens and neurotoxins, including volatile organic compounds, nitrous oxides, particulate matter, and other hazardous pollutants. This, and radioactivity, because they'll be using shale gas in this plant. Fracking somewhere else doesn't mean that we're not doesn't mean that we're not having fracking in New York State if we're using fracked oil and frack gas. I mean, in New York State, it's it's directly contradicts New York State's renewable portfolio standards, this project, and other sustainable federal, state, and regional energy goals. Um, uh, I'm trying to s summarize here. Uh, I know the time is late. In view of the foregoing Clearwater Views CPV's project and its related components as significant and st strongly recommends that the New York State Public Commission, Service Commission deny CPV the required certificates of compliance and necessity pursuant to Section 68, deny the approval of financing pursuant to Section 69, and deny approval of a lightened regulatory regime at this time. The, 
as has been stated earlier, a 10-day public comment period is insufficient for community groups and citizens to comment on this very extensive project. And we ask the Public Service Commission to hold an issues conference and a technical conference on these matters and to extend for at least 30 days public comment. In addition, as we've heard today, there are many issues that are new that were not addressed in the FEIS that need to be addressed before the Public Service Commission can make a determination on to, with regard to the uprate from the controversial, whether it's 650, 685, 850, what is the number? What is that amount? It, whatever, if there's a differential from what was considered to what is now being considered, an SEIS must be addressed. The ammonia levels, the quantity of ammonia, the aquifer issues, and the fact that this is not, though we are a home rule state, this is not a local issue. This is a regional issue. This is regional planning. And to have a small town make the determinations for our entire region is dangerous to our community, to our environment, and to our economy. So we ask once again for the PSC to not approve. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Evelyn, is it Price? Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Hello, I'm Evelyn Price. I'm here as a mother and as a teacher. I teach at the moment an energy course for the Hudson Valley homeschoolers. And we were talking about shell gas this morning. And as I got out the charts that showed U.S. production in oil and gas, I asked the kids to point to me on the chart when they were born. And I almost cried. I almost cried. These kids were babies. These, some of these kids weren't even born when decisions were made about their life. And the most important decision here is the 2005 Haley Burton loophole. And that goes to the very core of this process here. This is supposed to be a democratic process. But do we know what we are talking about? I wish you wouldn't have cut short the gentleman from the southern tier because what he had to say went right to the heart of the, this problem. How can you approve a plant when you don't even know what it's running on? The Haley Burton loophole exempts the oil and gas industry from the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. That means they don't have to disclose what they put in the wells and what ends up in the gas. That is supposed to be going to be fired here at Baba Yonder. How can you have an environmental assessment when you don't even know what you are burning? And hey, there are so many providers, so many different providers. Each has their own proprietary plan that's supposed to be just supposed to be like Pepsi Cola. Hey, if it's just like Pepsi, why can't we know what's in it? Why do we have to be exempt from the Clean Air and Clean Water Act? So how can we have a democratic process? How can we talk about this here? How can the town of Wawayanda decide whether that project is of public convenience, whether it is safe, when we don't even know what we are talking about. And I, I ask you to look at these kids here. I, I brought them because I fear for their future. And look, they seem to, like I was so, also so flabbergasted by some people in this room just like scoffing at information that was offered. Like, Pramila, thank you so much for your offering. And I just want to show you like what kids what kids understand this process to be like. And I, you know, this is a science here project. They have a good clue. They have a good clue of what's going on. And I ask you not to let them down. OK, well, I, I also, so, whoops, I submitted also to the record. Um, we are describing what fracking does. It shows how it's poisoning the air, how it's poisoning the water that we drink, accidents that can happen, such as well pad explosions. 
here we have a pipeline explosion because you have hydrogen sulfide in, in, the pipeline, in the natural gas, which is corroding the pipelines. It's a highly corrosive, very toxic thing. It's also very dense, and you're talking about Baba Yanda being in a basin. Hydrogen sulfide that is leaking out will be collecting in the basin. It's very toxic. Um, next, we have the health effects. Then we have the creation of sinkholes from like a rock just being come out. Someone really likes sinkholes. Um, then you have the triggering of earthquakes, and we just learned that this power plant is supposed to be built on a fault line. You already have Indian Point on a fault line. So if you are promoting fracking here, we are just like saying, well, let's light a Hiroshima bomb right in our backyard. And what do we have here? Oh, we have greenhouse gases. We all know that methane, which is leaking out of pipelines, which is leaking out of compressor stations, which will be leaking out of the Baba Yanda power plant, is uh, 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide, which, of course, this power plant will also admit. And then we have a nice summary of like, even like the helicopter that is trying to uh, quell the fire is catching on fire. But you could see as a comment on the emergency services available to really deal with this sort of issue. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Thomas Solomon. 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 No problem. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, my name is Thomas Salamone. I'm a resident of uh, Westtown, uh, New York, in uh, the Minnesing Valley. I'm also a member of the uh, Minnesing Valley School Board. Uh, I did vote no for the project. I don't think the the uh, the project has um, the right to be in an agricultural residential community. I don't think it's the right decision for our children's future and the thousands and thousands of children that are going to be affected by this. Um, you know, it's very real uh, in this valley with the ozone level. We, you know, we do hold a lot on that pollution. Um, I'm not against any of the local union guys. I'm not even against any of the CEOs because I know when you guys go home and tuck your kids in at night, you got to be thinking there's a better way. And especially just recently that I would say you're a pioneer from ExxonMobil. I'm with Rex, not in my backyard. That's it. I'm going to kill this one too. Uh, next speaker is Jurgen Weckerly. Is that close? Close. Hi, my name is Jurgen Weckerly. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the uh, Sterling Forest Highlands Committee of the Atlantic Chapter Sierra Club and uh, conservation chair of the local Ramapo Caskill group of the Sierra Club. Uh, I'm a, I grew up in Orange County. Uh, growing up, uh, our family purchased certified, not pasteurized, certified milk and produce from the Barman Farm, which is the location of the CPV plant. Uh, I'm retired now. I was a lifelong uh, union member and uh, shop steward a good part of that time. My retirement depends on the jobs of our union members here, just as their retirement depends on the jobs of their children in the future. I totally endorse and support the comments of Mr. Hurst against this project. Uh, jobs, important as they are, have to have a meaningful, productive, public purpose. Uh, this plant, in effect, is an energy factory. Factories, post deregulation, that's kind of their category for tax purposes and everything else. Uh, they are not utilities. They are semi-regulated, but they, they are, the purpose of factories is not to create jobs. The purpose of jobs is to support the meaningful, uh, productive output of a needed good or service of the factory itself. And in this case, the problem is, will CPV have any meaningful revenue, income to support its debt service, to support its operation, to even add into 
the, the need for energy that we all obviously use and share. There is no need. That is what the whole problem is. And it doesn't matter what the source of the energy is, whether it's good, clean, or dirty energy. It doesn't matter. If you don't need it, you just don't need it. And the, the ability uh, to pay back is not been proven and not been shown. And that is a, an important consideration in terms of what your uh, uh, duty will be with the eventual determination here. The, we have examples of our four power plants, Dan Scammer, uh, Roseton, uh, uh, Bowline, and Lovett. All are closed. Those were the plants that supplied all of our power. They ran uh, full time, and they're not in operation right now. The need for energy from power plants has decreased incredibly. There are other sources that have not been discussed, especially net metering, solar. We're talking about industry-wide uh, uh, individual factories getting their own renewable energy sources. Uh, Walgreens just announced putting solar on all of their outlets across the country. All of these efforts incrementally are taking market share from power plant production and are providing the electricity that we actually do need. The power purchase agreements that municipalities like the town of Esopus, 4,000 uh, panels, solar panels on their closed landfill to support all of their municipal services. Some of the efforts from the city of Middletown of putting solar on the closed landfill, which is really tiny though, to help power the uh, sewer treatment plant that is to provide water for CPV. Those are the efforts that are encroaching into the market share of power plants and why the future of power is totally being revolutionized. The reason Bowline, uh, Lovett, uh, Roseton, and Dance Camera went out of business was they were losing money. They all acknowledged in the bankruptcy proceedings that they were not producing more than 25% of their capacity and they could not fund any of their operations even though they had cheaper oil were established, had no debt service to speak of in the conventional sense that a new plant would, would incur. Power plants upstate, Cayuga in, in the Ithaca area, uh, Dunkirk in, in, in the uh, Buffalo area, they're the same thing. Those power plants and their petitions before the Public Service Commission to close down cited that they were not producing more than 25% of their capacity. They were losing money. And the alternative uh, was to uh, the two utilities, National Grid and uh, NISAC, indicated for 30 million bucks each, they could wire in through transmission the same output from that the power plants were, were producing and needed by the area uh, versus a 600 plus million dollar repowering of those plants that still would not be profitable because they still didn't have the customers to, to pay for what they have now. They won't with uh, on coal, they won't have the customers to pay for gas. It, it's not a question of fuel source, it's a question of the customer base has disappeared. And that was not uh, addressed in the EIS or the documents before you. The, the um, Several plants, Calpine was mentioned. The reason that Calpine went out of business was because they had no customers. They folded because there was no market. They could get no contracts. There were three power plants in the city of Middletown, Harriman, and over the border in Ringwood that Orange and Rockland post deregulation contracted with Bechtel to produce based on gas supply. They realized that the population and growth projections in Orange County uh, actually took place but the household use diminished. It did not go up on a linear scale like it had during the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s. They had to sue Bechtel in court to get out of that take-or-pay contract, even though Bechtel had expended no money in construction. And the court upheld because of the effect on ratepayers of paying excess costs for electricity that wasn't needed and available. Uh, that is what we're facing right now. Other power projects. The Champlain Hudson Power Express, which the Public Service Commission uh, granted most of their approvals, and I'm not sure if the presidential permit has been settled yet or not, uh, bringing uh, cable power from Canada down the Hudson to the metropolitan area. Their initial uh, application was for, for 2,000 megawatts. They cut that in half immediately once they discovered there was no need. 
okay? New York Regional Interconnect was another one of these schemes of getting Canadian power by way of the conventional grid to Utica and then having their own merchant transmission line parallel to the Marcy South line uh, west of the Catskills into the Rock Tavern substation. They eventually pulled their request because they could not get FERC to authorize a, a uh, ratepayer surcharge to pay for the construction, even though their initial uh, application was that they would be able to do it on their own, that there was a need and that investors would actually pay. Investors were too smart to pay, and FERC was smart enough not to grant that, and NIRI pulled their application, and the Public Service Commission wisely accepted their withdrawal with prejudice. They could not reapply. Highly unusual based on the circumstances, which I'm sure included need and the cost to ratepayers. The other issues that are not even mentioned here or in the EIS proceeding was the impact of energy supply companies. We are getting electricity. We have the four plants that aren't producing. We have Indian Point selling most of their product to, to the New England ISO. Uh, the electricity is coming here from someplace. We have no shortage of electricity. And even with the congestion, uh, between Utica and Albany and Albany and Pleasant Valley and Dutchess County. Even with that, we are getting all the electricity we need. Where is it coming from? That has never been discussed. We need the electricity, we have it. The energy supply companies are one of those sources that in effect are buying bargain basement uh, surplus electricity from uh, the PGM system primarily and selling it subsidized by the state of course, undercutting the 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 supply produced by our own internal power plants. What's happened with ESCOs, Public Service Commission on its website uh, listing the complaints against the abuses of ESCOs to, to ratepayers and customers indicates that 10% of the accounts in New York State, the meters that are in the name, no matter how, we don't know how large or how many are in that household, one family or a factory or a municipality, 10% of the, of the uh, uh, account holders in New York State are getting their power from energy supply companies. That's 10 percent that no longer are getting their power from New York State power plant production. That has to be looked at and evaluated. But the biggest single uh, thing that undercuts the future of power plants in New York and the transformation that is taking place is not just uh, distributive energy, not just renewable energy, but the simplest thing of all, energy that isn't needed through efficiencies. And that is what the, the Energy Highway and the, the Governor's Energy Highway Initiative and what is currently before the Public Service Commission in terms of the transmission upgrade uh, uh, project with four competitors in this relatively new endeavor by the Public Service Commission to unblock the congestion. Our problem in New York, as was mentioned earlier, is this uh, surplus supply upside that cannot get to market. And that is uh, an example by the Athens generating plant. Why Athens in particular? It is in our load zone, but it's above the congestion point, and it is in financial trouble. Athens is a state of the art, the newest major power plant in New York State, less than, less than six years old from operation now. It is the model that CPV would be employing, and Athens can't make money in this market. They are having trouble, and they cannot get their electricity into the metro market, which is the highest consumer market that we have, that everybody wants to get into, to compete with other suppliers. They can't, they don't even have an opportunity to compete. They have proposed their own cable from Athens Catskill down the Hudson to Buchanan. So that is going to go through. That cannot be stopped. Uh, in terms of the, of the methodology. We're talking about an existing power plant that can't sell their electricity, and with the congestion, they didn't wait for the grid upgrades to take place. Uh, they are planning their own through West Point partners of, of constructing their own cable uh, directly into the market, which has uh, free run on the, on the kind of transmission lines. Between the approved, uh, the approvals pending for Champlain Hudson Power Express, which we oppose for other reasons, and this Athens plant, over 2,000 megawatts of new power uh, equals the output of, of Indian Point. So we have all these other sources. If you count the, the plans to repower Bowline, which the new owner is following bankruptcy 
have have uh, indicated that's why they bought back, uh, Bowline. If you have the new owners of of Roasten, which indicated they're going to repower Roasten, and not only that, they want a second thousand megawatt plant adjacent to Roasten on that same site. We're talking collectively, and if you include CPV, of over 7,000 megawatts of new power into this area. Subtract Indian Point, you have 5,000 megawatts of new power into this area, and there are no customers. What is that going to do with existing power plants or other suppliers? If CPV is built, jobs will be created for our local uh, contractors and, and uh, labor members. However, it'll come at the expense of putting their brethren in other power plants out of work. That's what's happening with this rolling uh, reduction of, of consumption and use throughout the state and throughout the whole uh, uh, East Coast here, actually, from Mississippi, our whole region of the Atlantic. The efficiencies promised by the, by the uh, upgrade, your map of the four uh, competing proposals, uh, they're not just modeling of what might happen. We have real examples, and we have the, the submissions of uh, uh, the two utilities upstate with, with Cayuga and Dunkirk of, of National Grid and NISAC of what they can do to supply the same energy at a tiny fraction of the cost without any new emissions at all, just based on what's up there. We, with this grid modernization, the surplus power that is available to us right now will actually have a market and the producers upstate will be able to survive and not raise their prices up there. It also will lower the prices here. That is important because you heard of the, of the FERC uh, capacity zone, which the Public Service Commission opposes uh, on, on very sound grounds of raising the prices. But you can double that because with new production here that's not needed, we will not benefit from the lower priced electricity that already exists that can't get to us. So you can almost double the cost to us, and we'll all be paying for the delivery charge increases based on the construction to upgrade the grid. So those are things that, that have to be looked at, and all these things took place uh, after the EIS was completed uh, and actually could not really address. Uh, that is a reason why a supplemental environmental impact statement is required and should take place, and why the, um, the efficiencies that, that are promised uh, should be explored further. We also have an ex the real example of the Lovett Power Plant, by the way, in, in Rockland County. Lovett went out of business before the bankruptcies were fully completed. Uh, Myrant and Dynagy were the two hedge fund holding companies that, that ran these things more f as speculation and it was more of a designer bankruptcy when they bought the damn places to begin with. They knew there was no need, and they were obsolete plants. Again, Athens is not obsolete, it's having the same problems. With Lovett, when it petitioned for uh, a permit to close, it had to show replacement power, like one of the major requirements. Well, if you, if you don't produce, where are we going to get the power from? There was no new generation that provided replacement power for Lovett. Simul, you know, independent of the Lovett closure decision, Con Ed, which had purchased Orange and Rockland, did a, a, a local upgrade of the, of the distribution system and constructed a new state-of-the-art, I don't want to say smart grid type thing, but it was a state-of-the-art substation. And the utility grade efficiencies from that substation upgrade equal the output of Lovett without any new generation being needed. That is a real-life example. We have the submissions on file with, with uh, Cayuga and, and Dunkirk, and if this, if this major congestion is, is implemented, it could be that Athens will not need their cable. It'll be that I Iberdrola, which has its own plan of getting a cable from New, uh, from, from, uh, New Scotland substation down to the Kingston area, because they can't get electricity to their service area in the Kingston, Saugerties, Woodstock area. So they need their own cable because of the congestion. If this goes through with the, with the major upgrades, there may be no need for those kinds of investments, and the um, uh, need for CPV is, is, has disappeared. We don't need it now. 
We especially will not need it if the upgrades go through. And in the filings, they all repeat that the utility grade efficiencies will seriously diminish the need for new generation. So we have major business plan uh, issues uh, throughout the whole utility industry and the power plant industry themselves have major problems that they're not addressing. And repeating and restoring uh, uh, infrastructure and, and generating sources with in-kind replacement services, just all it does is the horseshoe makers are making more horseshoes. They're not into the modern technology era. Thank you very much and thank you for your endurance. Now, I let that speaker go on because there was some new material presented. So that's not a license for everybody else to repeat stuff we already heard, OK? Uh, James Smith, Greg, begins with an M. James Smith has left. OK, it's then Greg. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't read the handwriting. It's either M-A-R or M-A-S-K-A-N. Okay. Hi. I really can't follow much of the presentations that were here tonight. Um, guys did a great, thorough job of speaking your um, voice. Um, for the record, I was a first responder when the Trade Center fell. I worked for the Port Authority. Um, I've also worked as a heavy highway uh, laborer, 472 union. Um, I was a, a, a contractor for the and um, paid my dues to the Chamber of Commerce um, in Orange County. And uh, I also worked for FEMA. Um, I was helping the people in New York recover from the disaster. Um, I am 150,000% against um, this compressor station. Um, there are many peer-reviewed articles that show that dirty natural gas is worse than coal, worse than oil, and uh, all the exempt um, provisions, environmental laws that allow the polluters, the dirty natural gas polluters, to destroy our environment. Um, I had an interview today with the New York City um, School Construction Authority, because I'm not working with FEMA anymore, and um, it pays 80000 I'm called back in on Thursday for another interview. Um, personally, I'd rather get up to uh, move up to um, Lake Placid or maybe Vermont where they ban fracking statewide um, and live in a clean environment because the definition of clean isn't what you see in New York City. Unfortunately, when you drive closer to the city, you see smog. Smog is only caused by fossil fuels, coal, uh, natural gas, and oil. It's not caused by anything else. And why is respiratory illness so high in the cities? Why are other diseases so high in the cities? Look at the lime green, um, when I worked in Forest Hills for FEMA, the lime green landscape, the, the brown, and I saw that today during my interview going in, parking in Secaucus Junction from here in Westtown, which I haven't seen yet from the compressor station where there are no jobs currently, nobody's working in the compressor station, there's no environmental laws governing um, what's going on with the uh, compressor station. And that's all here from the exemptions from the, the major, seven major um, federal environmental laws. So um, I can't follow up on what these brilliant people who've done their research um, have said, but um, I don't have any kids here. Um, I'm a single, I mean, I have a girlfriend. So she's gonna sell her house and we're gonna move to either um, the Burlington area where it's more progressive, where they appreciate clean air, where they appreciate the human um, element and um, or maybe um, the Adirondacks where I could just hike and work as a mountaineer somewhere and make nothing and I'm happier doing that so that's it Thank you. okay the next uh, speaker is Douglas Bird followed by Ellen Weininger and Bill Fioravanti Oh, that was, was that Doug? No, he, he was. Oh, oh, we have a pass. And Ellen Weiniger is the next speaker then.
Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address this public hearing. My name is Ellen Weininger. I am the Educational Outreach Director for Grassroots Environmental Education, a New York science-based environmental health nonprofit that works with leading medical and scientific experts in the environmental health field. I'm an environmental health educator and a public health advocate. The permitting of the CPV Valley Energy Center poses many serious concerns regarding public health and economic impacts. This project promotes significant increases in fossil fuel development and production by promotion and expansion of fracking of methane gas and further build out of methane gas infrastructure to support the plant. This will result in significant ex escalation of methane emissions throughout methane gas production and delivery life cycle, which is in direct conflict with Governor Patterson's Executive Order Number 24 requiring that New York State reduce total greenhouse gas emissions by 80% from 1990 levels. Methane gas is a fossil fuel, not a clean energy fuel. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, methane is 86 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period, and 34 times more potent over 100 years. Recent studies demonstrate significant methane leaks in existing aging methane gas delivery infrastructure in Washington, D.C., Boston, and New York City. Studies have also shown that methane emissions from drilling and fracking operations are as high as 9%. This proposed project ignores these crucial facts. Last year's peer-reviewed report by Dr. Uh, Mark Jacobson at Stanford University and a team of scientists and, and economists provided a roadmap for New York to reach 100% renewable energy by 2030. The wind, water, and sunlight plan, as it is known, provides a roadmap to potential proportions and amount of power provided by each renewable resource and its footprint. These renewable energy solutions are on a shelf right now, readily available to meet our energy needs by 2030. The report explains the technical capacity that we already have, the economic feasibility that we have, and benefits of renewable energy infrastructure that can transform New York by eliminating dependence on polluting fossil fuels. This means reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. This means energy independence. This means energy security. This means jobs jobs, jobs. This means improved water and air quality. This means protection of public health, lower health care costs, and stabilization of energy costs. The wind, water, and sunlight plan would also reduce New York's electric power demand by 37 percent. Just last week, Dr. Jacobson and his team released a 50-state roadmap to 100% renewables by 2050, with meaningful targets for the reduction of climate-changing greenhouse gas emissions. Last month, a Minnesota administrative law judge recommended the largest ever proposed solar project over five other proposals that the state's utilities submitted to state regulators as part of a competitive bidding process. The other projects considered were almost exclusively for new methane gas power plants. According to the judge, the solar proposal provided the most cost-effective deal. The judge in his report stated that the proposed solar project, known as the Geronimo Project, would have numerous socioeconomic benefits, minimal impacts on the environment, and best supports Minnesota's efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. He also stated that the project is the most reasonable and prudent alternative to meet the utility's needs. The project will receive no state or utility subsidies, but would qualify for a federal tax credit. The expected cost of the solar project is $250 million. Building methane gas infrastructure will take billions of dollars, and the wet network of aging and leaking methane gas pipelines will add many billions of dollars more to the ratepayers' tax tab. 
Just a few days ago, it was reported that the cold weather is bringing swings in methane gas prices, despite the shale gas rush. While last year methane gas prices hit record lows, this year methane gas prices have spiked to the most expensive prices seen since the 2008 economic collapse. Methane gas has always been prone to sudden booms and busts. Utilities and customers are paying the heavy price. The Nebraska Public Power District shut down its gas-fired plants because the costs were 300% higher. Manufacturers relying on methane gas in New England shut down for days over this winter due to high methane gas prices, leaving workers without pay. New York City residents have seen a 20% spike in power bills. Part of the problem is that cold weather can interfere with drilling and fracking, with wells freezing over just when heat is needed most. On the other hand, wind energy infrastructure investments have paid off during this rough winter, saving utilities in mid-Atlantic and Midwestern states millions of dollars per hour during peak demand times in this extreme weather period by providing massive quantities of very valuable electricity when grid operators needed it most to meet demand from electric heaters and furnace fans and to keep the lights on. Jobs, more jobs with wind energy. New York cannot bear the burden of public health, environmental, and economic impacts of increased greenhouse gas emissions, water contamination, and air pollution from the unwise and unnecessary development and production of methane gas and its hazardous infrastructure, of leaking and explosive pipelines, polluting compressor stations and gas-fired power plants, and leaking and aging methane gas delivery systems. According to Mount Sinai School of Medicine's recently released report, New York State's Children and the Environment Environmentally mediated disease continues to spiral and take a huge toll on our most vulnerable population, our children. Asthma has tripled in the past three decades and has become the leading cause of emergency room visits, <coughs> hospitalizations. It affects 250,000 New York children. Air pollutants are known to contribute to childhood asthma. Birth defects are now the leading cause of infant death. Certain birth defects have doubled in frequency. Developmental disorders such as ADHD, dyslexia, and learning disabilities affect one of every six American children. Autism has increased sharply in prevalence and now afflicts one child in 88. Primary brain cancer among children has increased in incidence by nearly 40% from 1975 to 2004, according to the National Cancer Institute. Childhood leukemia has increased in incidence by 40, over 40%. 40 Benzene and other solvents are linked to those. According to the World Health Organization, environmental exposures are responsible for 35% of all childhood disease and deaths worldwide. The US National Academy of Sciences has determined that environmental factors contribute to 80 to 28 percent of developmental disorders. This all comes at a hefty price to families, schools, communities, health institutions, and our society. A recent analysis estimates that the cost of environmentally disease, mediated disease in New York's children adds up to over four billion dollars annually. That figure accounts for children in New York and does not factor in costs to taxpayers for the adult population impacted by toxic exposures. Children are uniquely vulnerable. They take in more contaminants pound for pound than adults do. Their organ systems are immature and incapable of detoxification. The proposed CP Valley Energy Center will emit, and you've heard, carbon monoxide 34 tons per year, nitrogen oxide, 186.8 uh, tons per year, particulate matter, 95 tons per year, volatile organic compounds, 65 tons per year, sulfur dioxide, 42 tons per year, sulfuric acid, 
13 tons per year and carbon dioxide 2,164,438 tons per year. And this does not even factor in the um, emission reduction credits, which will further increase those toxic emissions. This is just from one methane gas powered plant. Multiply the annual emissions per plant by all of the gas powered plants and the ones yet to be approved, the ones about to be approved, and all of the other methane gas infrastructure, such as compressor stations like the one just next door in Minisync, and metering stations. The expert reports um, that have studied the acute and chronic health impacts experienced by individuals living and working, and working, near gas infrastructure, including compressor stations and gas-powered plants, include, for the acute um, issues, uh, irritating skin, eyes, nose, throat, and lungs, respiratory impacts, headaches, dizziness, fatigue, skin rashes, vision and visual impairment, irregular heartbeat. Uh, for the chronic um, health impacts, again, for individuals living and working near this gas infrastructure, Damage to liver and kidneys, damage to lungs, damage to cardiovascular systems, damage to developing fetuses. We haven't even talked about pregnant women and unborn children. Reproductive damage, mutagenic impacts, developmental malformations, damage to the nervous system, brain impacts, leukemia, aplastic anemia, changes in blood cells, impacts to blood clotting ability. These are just a few of the impacts. Cumulative impacts of the entire life cycle of methane gas development and production and expansion of its infrastructure, whether in New York State or elsewhere, are ignored yet significantly increased greenhouse gas emissions and toxic pollutants. Public health and economic impacts have been ignored, and there are serious public health and economic impacts. Significantly increased exposure to polluted air and water contaminated farmland, industrialization of communities with toxic emissions from industrial plants to process, store, and distribute liquefied natural gas and petroleum natural gas, polluting compressor stations, methane gas-powered plants, leaking and exploding pipelines, fueling stations, fracking well pads, truck traffic and accidents, train derailments from shipping carbon fuels, higher levels of radon gas, the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers in the methane gas supply to consumers, leaking and aging delivery infrastructure, toxic radioactive fracking waste and its constituents disposed in landfills and wastewater treatment facilities applied on roads and on farmland are serious consequences of increasing frac gas and will mean greater toxic exposures and significantly increased greenhouse gas emissions across New York State and elsewhere, whether or not fracking is permitted in New York. We need clean air to breathe. We need clean water to drink and uncontaminated food to eat. If this CP Valley gas power plant is permitted, green, greenhouse gases will continue to spiral. Contamination of our precious natural resources and harm to human health are a certainty. This is unacceptable. There's no second chance. New York State can do better. Renewables, energy efficiency, and conservation, these are the tools and the solutions on the shelf now to reach 100% renewables by 2030 with stabilization of energy costs, with improved air quality and improved water quality, with protection of public health, and reduced health care costs and reduction of electric power demand by 37%, and with increased job growth. This is your critical opportunity to get it right by rejecting this unwise, unnecessary, and hazardous CP Valley Energy Center. Thank you. Bill Fior Ravanti. And the next one after that will be Alex Lotorto.
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Bill Fioravanti. I am the Director of Business Attraction. I'm sorry about the feedback. My phone, is that a problem? No, I just stand up there. It was my phone. I'm going to try that one more time. All right, it may have been my phone. Uh, for those of you that don't know the Orange County Partnership, we are your Office of Economic Development. Uh, really put that more plainly, our job is to grow and strengthen our economy. Certainly we do that by trying to attract businesses that bring jobs, but do other things to infuse money in the economy and again further st uh, strengthen what we do. Uh, we have been working with CPV Valley for a good six years trying to make this project happen. Uh, again, we are all about growth, but we are about balanced growth. We live here too, so we want it to be safe for, for not just the local mun municipalities, but for the county and region altogether. Uh, I do have a letter here from our CEO, Maureen Hallahan, uh, but it's to the PSC. It's in support of the project. Again, we've been working closely with it. Um, it does mean jobs. It means permanent jobs, a number of good quality permanent jobs. It's not hundreds of jobs, but that's why we work to bring in other employers like Amy's Kitchen and UNFI and some of the other recent successes we have had. Uh, but it also brings in construction jobs. I know we, a lot of people have been calling them uh, temporary jobs, kind of like putting a negative connotation like it's a dirty word, but those construction jobs are important too, as you heard from a lot of the, the laborers that were here as well. Uh, it's also going to infuse money in this economy, uh, the least of which isn't uh, CPV Valley is a company with a lot of resources. They've already contributed to our local nonprofits. I used to run a couple local nonprofits. I know how important that is, so that's another way it's going to help it. But the way we see it with this issue, it's something even beyond that. It's something, it's about capacity, really. We, we are in need. There is a power shortage. I know, Jurgen, you've, you, you've talked about a lot of other issues. Speak to your power companies. They will tell you that, uh, that there is a power shortage. That's, it's tight now, and there's a looming shortage. And really, to us, when capacity, if and does, run out, and, and this, this county has continued to grow, certainly what we want to see, good, again, balanced growth. Uh, for the, the previous decade, pretty much we all know that this was the fastest growing county in New York State. It's still the fastest, fastest growing county in Hudson Valley. So we hope that that good, clean, balanced growth continues to happen. But as soon as we're out of capacity with power, that's over. Growth is over, strengthening the economy in that regard is over. Then we're talking about contracting and weakening, and we, at the Orange County Partnership alone, we're not about to let that happen, and our only hope is that you don't let it happen either. So uh, we, we certainly understand both sides of this debate like this is absolutely very healthy. We think it's great and appreciate everyone's concerns, especially those that live right next door. We certainly understand that. But this is great, balanced growth. CPV Valley has done the due diligence. Uh, with, that's why we have the, the, uh, the EPA, the PSC, the uh, zoning boards and planning boards. That's the purpose. And again, they've done that due diligence. So. It's a quality project that we are certainly strongly behind. We hope that you can be as well for the sake of Orange County, not just now, but in the future. Thank you. Uh, Alex Lotorto and then Ramona Harrigan will be the last speaker. My name, is, my name is Alex Latorto. I'm uh, with the Energy Justice Network. Uh, we're a small nonprofit out of Philadelphia, but I work in, I'm based in Pike County, and I work throughout the Marcellus Shale Fields in Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a lifelong Pennsylvania resident, and um, I'm here to partially speak on that behalf, but I'm also a, a union delegate for the Industrial Workers of the World, and unlike some other unions that spoke tonight, our slogan is not, as long as I get mine, it's an injury to one is an injury to all, and that's in our Constitution. We coined that phrase, okay? And I want to make sure that um, I speak to three issues. One is the jobs. Um, first of all, uh, I work very closely with unions. I just returned from Washington, D.C. from the Blue-Green Alliance Conference. It's a conference where IBEW, the U.S. Steelworkers, are two unions who operate coal-fired uh, power plants and other power plants throughout the country. Uh, were present there speaking. I was with the Utility Workers of America, where I spoke, I had a long conversation with their president. Um, the leadership of these unions uh, nationally, regionally, and internationally uh, are talking about and, and, and transforming the conversation to talk about a just transition. Okay, and that means the a promise of, a, of good jobs and good environment are not two competing goals. They can work, they can be together and fight for clean energy and good jobs that don't require us to harm ourselves, each other, our families, our neighbors, or the environment, okay? 
and that's why that's why I work. We have an environmental unionist caucus in my union. We're very active in looking into these things. We educate our members, and we make sure that our work and our jobs don't impact the, or harm other people. Because we don't just say, as long as I get mine, you know, it's called an injury to one's an injury to all. Now here I have a map of Pike County. It's a neighboring county to Orange County. Uh, we have a proposed compressor station that will be used to push gas into the CPV power plant. Uh, it's uh, Col uh, Columbia Pipeline, which is a uh, sister brother company or um, uh, spawned company from NYSource, which is also Millennium's um, uh, parent company. Uh, they're looking at building a 9,400 horsepower that would make uh, send the gas from the Tennessee Pipeline here, which comes from the shale. You even see some shale gas leases here in Pike County along the Delaware River here. Um, it, it connects to the Columbia line, which goes north to Minisink, which hits the Millennium and goes over to um, the CPV plant. And the, the Tennessee pipeline and the Millennium pipeline both, both source gas from the, the Marcellus shale fields, the closest being in Susquehanna and Bradford County. Um, in Bradford County uh, the and Susquehanna, the gas is split between the, the Tennessee and Millennium for uh, eastern transmission. Um, with uh, north-south uh, highways that hit the, um, it's the laser line in Susquehanna and the boardwalk line in Bradford County um, that go north-south. And so they share the gas and they're transmitted by Kinder Morgan Partners and, and NICE sources competing, um, you know, business uh, competitors. And we're right here at the middle. Uh, Milford Township, um, right near, right across the street from that proposed compressor station, which, by the way, is not using the best, um, uh, they're not, they're going to, they plan on doing blowdowns, which are unnecessary. They, the best practice, they're not using the best practices. They use blowdowns, they have uh, less noise reduction uh, and less vibration reduction to cut costs, which also cuts jobs. Okay, the, the EPA Gas Star program works with their industry and talks about how to put these, these best attachments on so that they don't have to do blowdowns, they do enclosed flares or they capture the gas and sell it as product and all the additional costs of that technology is absorbed by selling the gas in the long run. But these companies are in such a rush, and I'll tell you why they're in such a rush, to cut the amount of jobs they use to, br to build these compressor stations, which screws the unions out of the job, right? And they're also in such a rush to harm the environment and, and do blowdowns instead of capturing the gas because the, the Columbia Pipeline, when they do this in interconnect, is going to go south. And in their application to FERC, they state that there's a demand that's yet to come online somewhere south uh, along the Columbia Pipeline. Well, what, what could possibly be require um, all this extra horsepower besides just this power plant, the CPV plant? Well, it's the Cove Point, Maryland plant. Okay, it's an ex LNG export facility that's going to send billions of cubic feet of gas overseas. And that, that, sort, that demand for overseas gas they're, they're expanding the Panama Canal to get these bigger tankers over to J Japan, okay? Read about it. That's going to compete with your CPV plant. And when the methane price spikes because overseas exports are going up, CPV and their, whoever buys the plant because they're going to sell it to the local utility is going to be happy to put the workers idle. They will idle your IBW brothers. They will send them home and they'll say, oh, the price is too high. We're going to get, a, uh, now with the grid efficiencies, we're going to get gas from uh, other sources and other parts of the grids. This plant is, is a justification to, 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 for public need to build these pipelines so that they can get the Cove Point and the uh, offshore one from uh, Long Island is the uh, Port, Ambrose. Port Ambrose and, and the, uh, the, the Boston plants with, after it connects to Mawa, New Jersey over there, it goes all the way up to Boston where they want have an import uh, facility they want to transfer over there to next export. The gas is not for, for here. The, the power plant, obviously, we they stated, is, is, uh, is not needed as far as generation. The, the hundreds of millions of dollars that go into getting the gas to the power plant, building the power plant, maintaining the pipelines, is could put more guys to work, more people to work, and women too, uh, you know, by doing the clean energy, clean energy uh, economy. And it's it, the Blue Green Alliance, your union, the United Steelworkers Union, who makes the pipe, the laborers were there too, the, the utility workers of America, all agree that there's a better future available to us, but the, we have to take this opportunity in our own hands. And I'm, sa I'm, so I'm really sad to hear my union brothers heckling who was a woman who could easily have been their wife who's concerned about public health and throwing these communities under the bus because people's property values too are at stake. You have union teachers who spoke tonight who've paid their, paid their pension money uh, and paid into their homes and their mortgages to afford, afford their homes. Okay, and their home values are going to go down, and that, those wages that they earn for their entire lives, 
to, the, to purchase our homes and live in this beautiful area will be uh, le worth less. And who's going to pay for those stolen wages? Well, I'll tell you who's going who's to pay for it. We're going to pay for it, and they're going to collect their shareholders' money, and they're going to pay out to their shareholders. They externalize the cost. It's cost of externality. It's an economic principle. They can put in a facility and have everybody else pay for the, the external costs, and then they get to make the profit. And that's, that's, the, that's how they operate. That's how they operate in Pennsylvania. That's how they'll continue to operate in New York. And, I'm, and I don't want my compressor station built. It starts on August 1st, and I'll be there in the road blocking it. And I'm going to talk to the steam fitters and talk to them about not working there in Scranton. And I'm really sick and tired of having to come to these hearings and say this because it, the, the regulators need to listen. And I hope New York is not going to make the same mistakes Pennsylvania's made. Uh, Ramona Harrigan. Hello, my name is Ramona Harrigan, and I'm here because I grew up in Wayweonda, town of Wayweonda, and my mother actually nursed Mrs. Varman on her deathbed. Um, Wayweonda was a rural farmland community that turned into a little bit more of suburbia as our area is growing. Um, I'm very upset and opposed to an industrialization of the area that we know will affect water, air, soil. We're the breadbasket to New York City. We have a lot of farms, we have a lot of organic growing, um, particulate matter. As you know, we're talking about, I've heard tons and tons of carcinogenic particulate matter. Um, they haven't even addressed, I didn't even hear if uh, there was a terrorist attack on that amount of ammonia. I think, you know, if you have just a little bit of ammonia in your bathroom, what that's like to your lungs. Um, we heard about a train spilling toxic chemicals. Could you imagine having your lungs burned out? We had someone here talking about 9-11, those people who went down there after the fact and cleaned up. They're all coming down with cancer. They can't breathe. People in their 40s you know, disabled, okay? Um, the other thing is, I belong to a union. My dad actually was a local 17. We had some union members here. I know people are desperate for jobs. People need jobs. If you're from upstate New York in the Albany area, you know this too, you know? But let's not be short-sighted. Our um, economic leaders here, they're so quick to just have a number on a graph, like we provided this many jobs. They don't look at the environmental impact. That's, that's really not their goal. As a matter of fact, this company, um, from what I could see, they're from uh, Washington, Virginia. They have sites all over the United States. I think the closest um, office is Braintree, Massachusetts. They actually sell, um, they auction gas, and they auction electricity off on the grid. Um, I read an article about one of their facilities in uh, California that there's such noise pollution which hasn't come up, the hum of this industrial mechanization, okay? Uh, we heard about health problems. We all know about, you know, lung cancer, cancer. Plenty of people here know people who have had cancer. You want to talk about particulate matter and air pollution in our area? Right now, you can see smog. You go up on the Shawangung Ridge in Bloomingburg and you look down over the valley in the summer, you just see the haze hovering there. You know, we fail the air tests many times. We have what they call those pollution days, you know. And we're talking about adding more. More for what? For what? Because somebody somewhere else in the United States sees that it's easy to hook up to this uh, Marcy power line. And um, I think I read in their thing, oh, they only needed a mile and a half to get to it, you know. Oh, you know, let's see, there's a lot of gas there in the Marcellus Shale. Let's uh, build a plant here. You know, we can justify this. Let's get, you know, oh, it's clean. This is not clean. Clean? Where do they get that from? I don't know. Um, so obviously I'm against this. Um, it's disheartening to see how they manipulate, you know, with let, let's go to 19% instead of 20% so we don't even have to address um, any, you know, terrorist or anything in case there's a crisis, which, you know what, stuff does happen, you know. 
And as far as the lead agency, that I heard a member of the lead agency is working for CPV. Didn't that just happen in Orange County government that one of the legislators, that I, I think the DA is investigating because he took a job with the um, architectural firm that's supposed, that got the contract to build the county building. And now we have a small little, you know, town away we yonder having one of their members working for the agency the corporation that's trying to get a project in. I just, I don't understand how this can go on here in America, you know. Is this a democracy? The people here keep saying, we don't want this. There's not a need for it. We don't want it. Is anybody listening? I don't, I'm sure these people who are developing this aren't going to be living around there. My mom lives within a few miles of this. You know, I don't want to have to have her gasping for air or, as you say, more birth defects for the kids. You know, we can't eat the food, we can't drink the water. Is that what we want? Would you want that? I don't think so. Please, listen to what the people are saying. You know, we don't want this. Thank you.